NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at SaveWithConrad.com. Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Brutes. Preacher. Who's Preacher? Well, you know. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. And it's WrestleMania week. I can't believe it, but WrestleMania night one is tomorrow. And WrestleMania night two will be here before you know it. But what we don't know yet is who's walking out the champ. Is it Cody Rhodes or is it Roman Reigns? Here's what I hope doesn't happen. What happened back at WrestleMania nine? I will never forget this. I did not get this WrestleMania on pay-per-view. And I asked my friend, I said to my friend, I said, friend, Bret Hart and Yoko Zuna wrestle for the world title in the main event. Who walked out champion? Hulk Hogan. What? No, no. I, I was talking about not the tag match, but the world title match. It was, it was Brett or Yoko. So which one's the champ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hulk Hogan. It was the biggest fight or one of the biggest fights in something to wrestle history. And we're going to revisit it just in time for the 30th anniversary. Man, I feel old. I can't believe this was 30 years ago. I remember that conversation, but the conversation you're about to hear might be one of the most heated in something to wrestle history. You're going to love it. And yes, we hope cross your fingers, knock on wood the next week with WrestleMania season in the rear view, Bruce will be back. But in the meantime, enjoy WrestleMania nine today and tomorrow enjoy WrestleMania 39. And we'll see you next week right here on something to wrestle. But now let's roll that beautiful bean footage of one of the most notorious fights it's something to wrestle history. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? It is wrestling mania nine time, by golly. I'm ready. I'm all about it. Let's get into WrestleMania nine, but first, let's top some loose ends from last week's episode. It's WrestleMania six. We're on our way to record numbers for that show. We appreciate all the support. Go ahead and tell your friends about WrestleMania six. If you dug it and if you missed it, it's in the archives. Now, now some loose ends, uh, bad news, Brown. We had a follow up there. Uh, I guess it came out in an RF video shoot interview that I didn't bring up last week that the original plan or so he was told was that he would get the win over Piper at WrestleMania, but then he was told Piper wouldn't agree to do the job. Uh, so if Piper wouldn't put him over, he wasn't going to put Piper over and they just did a double count out finish instead. Uh, he also went on record as saying he thought Piper was a racist and he ultimately quit the promotion over his WrestleMania six payday when he found out that Piper got roughly five times more than he did for the show. Had you heard that before? And, uh, why do you think bad news left if it wasn't over him being upset over the payday? Well, I think bad news was upset over his pay in general. I'm not sure it was, it may have been WrestleMania. I don't really know, but I think bad news also kind of might've felt everybody that didn't agree with his point of view was racist as well. So there you go. Uh, we got lots of tweets about Jesse Ventura name dropping Richard Belzer on the broadcast. Apparently somewhere in the Hogan warrior match, Hogan used a front face lock on warrior and gorilla said something like, Front face lock by the Hulkster. What a punishing maneuver this is. And Jesse quickly quipped, absolutely, ask Richard Belzer. Now, apparently that aired live in 90, but it was edited out for years afterwards. But somehow when the network debuted, it was left in. Uh, do, were you on a uh, headset and gorilla when that happened? Do you remember a reaction from someone? Was Vince hot about the line? Did Jesse know he shouldn't have did it when he did it? What do you remember about that? That's just Jesse being Jesse and, and being a smart ass and throwing that kind of inside stuff in there to rile Vince up. But no, we, 
if anybody was on headset at WrestleMania six, that would have been probably Dick Ebersol. But I doubt Dick fed him anything like that. What was the what was the reaction? I mean, it was edited out. Do you remember there being? Uh... I don't know that there was any reaction at, at the time. Uh, however, probably with Vince bringing it to his attention was like edit that shit out of there, get that out of there. We didn't need that kind of stuff for Belzer to come back and say, well, the WWE is making light of this lawsuit and me getting choked out and shit. Yeah. Uh, we had another Twitter follow-up to our Zeus episode too. Uh, there was a question as to whether or not the WWF match that was shot for the no holds barred movie, uh, that took place between rip Thomas and Jake bullet. Was that actually shot at a live event or on the movie set? No, that was shot at a TV taping. You know, at first I thought that was a ridiculous question because it was like, yeah, of course they're going to do it at TV taping. But if they're doing it in front of a live crowd, how do they explain that? They just say, hey, this is going to be a part of the movie and pay no mind to this person who you know as Hulk Hogan being Rip Thomas. And do they shoot the movie or the match differently? Because I know in in a real movie set, you know, if they're shooting a boxing match, they're going to take multiple takes and zoom in and do that over and let me get it from this angle. How can you kind of keep kayfabe here in the late eighties and shoot that the way it needs to be shot with really good cameramen. It was shot. Some of it was shot on film. Some of it was shot on tape, but the, the film portion of it was laid out very carefully for those guys to get those shots. And they did them multiple times, but you just do a live match in front of the crowd. You got professionals out there to know what the hell they're doing. They've got one, one or two, instances that they can get their shot and they better get them and a quick follow-up on our houston wrestling bonus show uh, that show was very well received and even if you're not really into houston wrestling uh, i think you'll be pleasantly surprised it's in the archives now and available for you uh, but because we had to edit the length of the show to make it fit on our current platform we missed a critical part of the story and that's where the name of this show comes from hit it bruce well, the something to wrestle with names comes from the Paul Bosch stationery that he used to have. Something to wrestle with from the desk of Paul Bosch. And I will tweet out a picture of his pads for everybody to see where I got that name from. And you kept it going during your tenure for the World Wrestling Federation. Tell everybody what you did. Well, I had the same uh, similar pads made up. Something to wrestle with from the desk of Bruce Pritchard. And that's just kind of a theme that I've always kept throughout my wrestling career. All right, Bruce, it's time. What happened when the WWF took WrestleMania to Sin City? It's WrestleMania 9, the very first outdoor WrestleMania. And man, what a weird time in the company. It's April 4th, 1993. uh, And I guess you could say the WWF here is trying to transition away from the Hulk Hogan era that built WrestleMania Uh, And it was actually the staple of all WrestleMania main events uh, up until 1993. We covered last week WrestleMania 6, which was 1990, when they first tried to pass the torch, so to speak, and end the Hulk Hogan era and move into a new Ultimate Warrior era. Well, that experiment didn't work out. So they wanted to give Hogan another shot at it the next year in 1991, and they used Sergeant Slaughter as the buffer to set up WrestleMania 7, which is also available in the archives. Uh, But the decline of WrestleMania really started with WrestleMania 6, continued with 7, and by 1992, they wanted something different, and they tried the longtime NWA World Champion Ric Flair as the man at WrestleMania 8, and he dropped it to Macho Man, but not in the final card, uh, or the final match on the card, rather, they still wanted to bring in Hogan for that one. By the way, we get lots of questions about WrestleMania 8, and when are we going to cover it? Uh, Bruce, why won't we ever cover WrestleMania 8? Because I wasn't there. So there you go. Uh, lots of talk about uh, WrestleMania business being down here for a minute. We've heard some of the boys in the past say that they didn't know what kind of year they were going to have until they got the WrestleMania payoff. Um, did Vince McMahon himself consider WrestleMania the difference between a good year and a bad year? I think it was a barometer. The talent probably much more so than Vince, but obviously WrestleMania was our big Super Bowl. It was our big event. So it was one way to measure the success of the year. Sure. 
Uh, Meltzer reported that WrestleMania 8 in Indianapolis the prior year drew over 62,000 fans for a $1.25 million house, but heavy paper. Uh, keep those figures in mind. We're going to talk about nine a little later. Eventually, Flair ends up with the title back, but Vince decides to commit to a change, and he wants to put the belt on Bret Hart. It's worth mentioning here that Bret's first pay-per-view main event was with the Bulldog at SummerSlam 92 the prior year. Uh, Bruce was also not there for that, so we're never going to cover SummerSlam 92. Uh, That show was a huge success, and it helped cement Bret as a top guy. So fast forward to October of 92, Flair has vertigo, and Vince tells Flair he's going with what he called a youth movement and that he won't be featuring Rick in the main events moving forward. He allows Flair a chance to negotiate to go back home to WCW, which Flair opts to do. The next month in November, the Ultimate Warrior and the British Bulldog got fired for human growth hormone. And Brett wrote in his book that he had hoped the main event of WrestleMania 9 would have the Ultimate Warrior submitting to the sharpshooter in the main event. Of course, that didn't happen when Warrior got canned. Now, bear in mind, while all of this is happening, Hogan is away making the cinematic masterpiece that is Mr. Nanny. Uh, so this void of Mr. Perfect being out with Lloyds of London, warrior and bulldog fired for drugs, Hogan making movies, flair headed out of town. This all creates opportunities for Brett to work main event title matches against guys who've never had a chance to headline a pay-per-view Shawn Michaels and razor Ramon. Uh, and this is of course, when the WWF starts to brand this new crop of main eventers as the new generation. Uh, and it's believed that among other reasons that Vince chose Brett was because of his ability to deliver great matches, uh, the fan mail that Brett got and the amount of it, uh, how much merch he sold, his ability to draw huge money in Europe. And oh yeah, it's worth mentioning Vince needs a champion who can pass the eye test, so to speak for steroids, because that's still looming around in the background. And if you'd like to hear more about that steroid trial, it too is available in the archives. Um, but for whatever reason, Brett was considered a major draw internationally. Uh, now, candidly, domestic business is way down here, Bruce, and shows aren't drawing, and the WWF is even losing TV in some markets, where they've done well in the past. You were there in late 92 and early 93. What was the mood in the office? Were, were folks starting to feel like the success from the past was slipping through their fingers? It wasn't necessarily that the success of the past was slipping through the fingers. It was simply... Time to rebuild. Your old stars were just that. They were older, and they had moved on. So Hogan was not a part of the mix. Um, The guys that we thought a few years prior to that would be the future of the business and Ultimate Warrior had moved on. There was just a lot of change. There were circumstances within and beyond our control that we just had to deal with. We had to make changes. We were forced to make changes. So it wasn't one day we woke up and said, hey, let's just change for change's sake. There was a lot of other things going on. Hogan left. Um, Warrior in his drug situation. Bulldog. All these other guys. Rick had his vertigo situation. He was unhappy. He wanted to leave. Savage didn't want to work all the time. Randy didn't want to be on the road. Randy didn't want to work. So... You had to you had to come up with something new. You had to create something brand new. It wasn't out of hey, let's just create something brand new. It was out of a necessity to create something new. And in that in that whole frame of reference, you, you've got to say, okay, how do we prevent ourselves from getting in this situation again as well? Um, that was the mindset. That was, was the mindset. Was there anyone in particular who was pushing? for uh, a new generation thing or is this strictly just circumstantial that it all just shakes out that way it was pretty much circumstantial however the you know the bret hart thing was the product of several international tours where brett was and he wasn't really even the featured star on the tour but got the best reaction and was getting reactions like a rock star everywhere he went internationally. So we thought, well, hell, um, with that kind of a reaction overseas, well, shit, if we 
put some fire underneath that. Is he going to get that same kind of a reaction here in the States if we, you know, allow him some TV time and allow him to to be featured more so over here? And that was the thinking behind it. Just uh, take what we had and what people were buying internationally and sell it to him a little more domestically. Um, who would have been the guy pushing for Bret Hart to be the flag bearer? Is it strictly based on the numbers from Europe? It was a combination of things. It was looking at who deserved it and who was a workhorse doing something different, trying to get out of the shadow of Hulk Hogan and the ultimate warrior and, and what the championship had been prior to that you know what the company had been built upon and built around for so long let's try something completely different let's let's try a wrestling champion a a baby face wrestling champion because god forbid you have a heel have it and have a baby face chase but that's another story um so that was that was the idea and brett was the guy that was dependable he always had the best match on the card. He was usually the first one in the building and last one to leave. The thought process was, why not reward someone like that? And let's let's just try something different and give someone an opportunity that we felt deserved it. Brett wrote in his book that uh, Vince had told him that he was getting more fan mail than Hulk Hogan. Do you buy that? No. Uh, but you admit that Brett was doing really well internationally. Can you put your finger on why that may have been or how that could have come about? I can't, uh, but he, he was featured over the summer in the program with the British Bulldog. Right. And Bulldog was internationally and in, in Europe, a big name. Maybe that was it. I, I can't put my finger on it. But Brett walked on water internationally. Who loved Yokozuna? That feels like a Vince guy. Really, that was a Bruce guy. I had seen Rodney in Pensacola in Alabama uh, for the Fullers, working as Coquina. And Alpha wanted to bring him in for a tryout, and I just sung his praises because he was – for a 350 pounder, he moved like a 150 pounder and was just so damn agile in the ring. By the time he got up there, he was a little bit heavier, but he could still move. And Sergeant Slaughter was a huge Yokozuna fan as well and just sang his praises. Once Vince saw him and saw the, the I'll tell you what sold Yokozuna on everybody. The very first time that Yoko went out in the robe, and when he took the robe off, the reaction from the uh, crowd, it was like a, oh, unanimous. They were just in awe at the humanity before them. He was a big boy, for sure. He was a big boy, man. And then he, and then he could move on top of it. So he's a very impressive athlete. Uh, when did you guys know this is our WrestleMania main event? Meltzer was reporting it by January. So in my head, you guys knew in November, December, roughly, roughly December. Yeah. Because we, we were getting the reactions from Yokozuna and thinking people were talking about who the hell can beat this guy. How do you beat him? And it was that same kind of feeling of early Andre. Of how, how do you beat this monster, this giant of a man? So, you know, you make him your champion. You, you, you put your champion in a, in a position that he can't overcome. And that was the idea behind it. How do you get him out of the Royal Rumble? Uh, how many people will it take to eliminate him? And they can't. So how can one man possibly defeat him? In the January 4th, 1993 edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave wrote that the WWF lost its television in Germany, Austria, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Uh, when we say lost its television, explain how that would have come about. At that time, just contracts with the uh, television stations, the cable stations in the different countries they we're, had. We're probably done had. on an annual basis. So if this is coming out January 4th, it probably ended at the year 
at December 31st, 1992. Is that fair to say? Well, no, they, they all had their own different time frames of when they would start, when they would stop. But the also, also the idea, it's not fair to say that we lost it. They were moving. They were changing to another cable outlet. So Vince was making moves at that time. Sky Sports in the U.K. was looking to expand um, their operations, and they wanted us to be a big part of that. So, yes, we did lose it, but we were moving it. We were going with Sky. We were going to be doing something different. That same issue of The Observer reports that the Randy Savage, Shawn Michaels matches that had happened on house show loops had been disappointments. And Dave even writes, quote, Savage seems to have lost his motivation in the ring. Uh, He would ultimately leave the WWF in October of the next year because he allegedly wanted to continue to wrestle and do a long program with Shawn Michaels. Uh, But according to the rumor and innuendo, Vince didn't think that was best for business and shut it down. So Randy went to WCW to continue wrestling. Would these matches here in January of 93 being a disappointment, would that have been part of the reason that Savage wouldn't be featured as much moving forward? Or is all of that bullshit and Randy just didn't want to work anymore? Yeah, and again, who who's saying it's a disappointment? Business wasn't good. Business wasn't good across the board. But Randy did not want to be on the road full-time, and Randy didn't want to work a full schedule anymore. Randy wanted to make the transition to announcer. Randy wanted to – Randy actually had moved to Connecticut, and Randy wanted to be a part of the office and contribute on the television side. So, no, that that's not accurate. Um, the January 15th, 93 edition, Meltzer reports that they did uh, a television taping where Yoko destroyed Jim Duggan and they even used blood for the first time in a long time. And then Yoko would drape the American flag over Duggan, who was left laying after four consecutive bonsai drops. Uh, Meltzer guesses here this is going to be Duggan's last appearance, but he was only off TV for about four months. He went on to finish up that summer. Uh, We'll talk about that uh, here in a bit. Uh, Sensational Sherry returned with Marty Jannetty. Now, this is notable here because in storyline, Sherry had been with Sean, but Sean had pulled her in front of him for a mirror-breaking spot, so she became the baby face, and the heat was all on Sean. This makes me think, since they're pairing her with Marty here, the idea is to set up Sean and Marty at WrestleMania, even though it's a year later than it should have been. Do I have that right, Bruce? That was one of the ideas floated out there, yeah. Cool. Uh, Luger and Mr. Perfect and Hart and Yokozuna appear to be the double main event for WrestleMania, uh, and that is straight out of the Wrestling Observer newsletter. He also says... Unless Hogan works, which seems unlikely based on his interview Monday night. I found it interesting, Bruce, that Meltzer thought Luger Perfect would be positioned as the co-main event. Was that ever considered to your knowledge? No, never. Never, ever. It was always designed. The original idea was designed to spotlight Brett, and to spotlight Brett as the champion. Um, Then the idea, you know, came up with Hogan being involved. And once we got Hulk, that would be your essentially your co-main event with beefcake and Hogan and money Inc. But no, Brett and I mean, uh, Luger and perfect. That was a feature. That was a feature match. Lots of, uh, folks are getting tryouts around this time. Uh, Dave reports that Horace Boulder, who is Hogan's nephew, Mike Balea, uh, Bill Irwin, Scott Putsky and Louis Piccoli all got tryouts. Uh, any memories of these guys or their tryout matches? Yeah, Horace was not good. Um, that was a favor to Hulk. Hulk wanted to look out for his nephew, brought him in. He just didn't have the charisma, didn't have the athletic ability that Hogan had, and didn't work. So, no, Horace didn't get a job. They tried him on the road for, for a little while after that, but it, it just didn't work. Bill Irwin... Same thing, just wasn't wasn't in the cards. Uh, Putsky, Vince always had a soft spot for Ivan Putsky because Putsky did very well for his old man and felt it was a way to, to repay Ivan and liked Putsky's look, and he was young and different, and he liked Putsky. 
couple other notes from this uh, same edition of the Observer. Primetime Wrestling did a 2.2 rating for its final show ever. Uh, we've talked about the new generation and this kind of being a transition, but man, Primetime Wrestling ending really does feel like the end of an era, does it not? It was for me because that was the first show that I ever produced, and the fact that you're taking it from a studio show and we were going to go on the road with another event oriented, a live event oriented show. That was a big deal for us. It was a, a new expense and a, just a whole new, new enterprise. Little did we know that it would become what it has today. Uh, Dave reports that the Steiners were uh, set to start full time on the road on January 8th. Anything memorable you can share about signing the Steiners, Bruce? I'm sure we'll talk about them a lot in the future. The you know the main thing that I remember was Pat and I being enamored with Scott Steiner as a single and wanting to bring Scott in. Frankly, the original idea pitched to Vince was to bring Scott Steiner in as a surprise entry into the Royal Rumble and to win the Royal Rumble and go on to win the championship at WrestleMania, go with a completely brand new guy. Uh, Vince didn't see it, didn't feel it. And when we reached out to the Steiners and the, the Steiners, Rob and uh, Scott came in to meet with Vince, they expressed that they wanted to be a tag team. They wanted to be together. And, and that's how Vince saw them. Vince didn't see them as a, as single draws. That's amazing to me how different it could have been had, Scott split off back then, main event of WrestleMania, won a Royal Rumble. Interesting to think about. Yeah, that's one. Of, and again, that's one of those, as I've talked about before, a what if scenario when we're sitting there and we're just we're brainstorming, pitching ideas and Pat and I throwing different shit out there. And what if? Uh, Brent Hart appears on Arsenio Hall and Regis and Kathy Lee to promote the Royal Rumble Dave writes about it here, and we talked about this last week on our WrestleMania 6 episode with how Macho and Warrior did doing stuff like this. By comparison, how do you think Brett did? Didn't think it was Brett's forte. Uh, as bad as I felt Warrior was in his role, not being able to fit in that environment, I felt the same thing about Brett. Brett wasn't comfortable in that environment. And I didn't think he came across well. He was a little bit too introverted and too shy almost. And I didn't think that he came across well in that in that role. Meltzer writes about the debut of Doink the Clown. Uh, he says, I'm told his ring entrance is great because of the music, but the act dies the minute the bell rings. Then again, Honky Talk Man was mainly a ring entrance, and he drew them a ton of money. And Bruce, I want to talk about Doink a lot, and I'm sure we'll have a whole episode on him eventually, but it seems to me there was so much backlash against him in the newsletters and among smart fans now, I just think he's misunderstood. What say you, Bruce? I think that Doink the Clown with Matt Bourne portraying Doink the Clown was probably one of the greatest gimmicks ever. And given the opportunity without Matt Bourne's demons could have been one of the greatest draws and greatest stories in the history of the business. Doink got over, and that's something that the dirt sheet writers and, and those purists or whatever have you don't ever want to admit. Doink had heat. Yeah, we're going to get there. We'll cover it. Um, Meltzer reports that a sign was put up inside Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas for WrestleMania, and it listed Brutus Beefcake. Uh, Legion of Doom Animal, Paul Ellering, and Jake Roberts. This seems like a random group of folks. Would this have been something just for a random promotional appearance that they were doing at the venue, like a meet and greet? Or did someone think this was the WWF's strongest name to promote for whatever reason? I have no idea. It's probably something that people at Caesars Palace picked pictures off of a off of pictures they had been sent, just put guys up there not knowing who the hell they were promoting. And that happened a lot. The next week, Dave wrote that uh, Yokozuna has been squashing dudes in like four minutes, uh, guys like the big boss man. And he also reports that the advance gates for Undertaker Yokozuna main events were doing the best advance business they'd done in more than 10 months. Did you guys know right away 
that Yoko Taker would be somewhere you could go? And did you think at some point that could be a WrestleMania main event or was Taker not yet considered a mania main event caliber guy? Taker was considered an attraction. However, we did feel that Yokozuna and Undertaker against one another was a huge attraction, but we wanted to wait for that. Vince, and I know you're going to say, well, Undertaker was champion, but Vince didn't see Undertaker as the champion. He didn't see him as that guy at that time. He saw him as his Andre the Giant attraction in that role in that era. So while Undertaker and Yokozuna is a great attraction and would be terrific around the horn, I don't think that Vince saw that as a WrestleMania main event at that point yet. Now, later on, yeah, I, I think he he would go. God damn, of course I would. Yokozuna versus the Undertaker. Fuck yeah. But right then, he, he I don't think he felt it. Meltzer wrote, there's a good shot that Money Inc. would take on the Steiners. And he writes, quote, expect no record-setting buy rates on this. Uh, so we see by late January, there's still no discussion of Hulk Hogan. And we'll get to more of that later. But do you remember there ever being a discussion of Money, Inc. and the Steiners? Was that something that was kicked around when they were first brought in? Well, the program was definitely kicked around because of the the championship with Money, Inc. being the champions and what have you. But once Hulk was coming back and Beefcake coming back and that whole nine yards, they wanted to do that package deal of of Hogan and Beefcake. So we kind of knew where we were going with Hulk. The Steiners do debut on January 8th, and it's in Philadelphia. Uh, they worked against the Masked Executioners, uh, which was Barry Hardy and Dwayne Gill. The original opponents uh, were supposed to be Double Trouble, uh, I guess an enhancement team. Ted Petty uh, and the Executioners were being booked somewhat regularly on the road, Dave writes. Uh, Ted Petty is a guy that I know, but I don't have any recollection of him being here. I don't know how I forgot this. Do you have any memories of Ted Petty working during this era? And why didn't it work out long-term for him here? Ted just came in and was an enhancement talent. And that's it. You probably saw him on the Superstars and Challenge shows. But there was really nothing more with Ted. There were some different times where he tried out some different gimmicks. Uh, The Cheetah Kid. That's his most famous besides Public Enemy. Right, and Vince just didn't really see it. Vince Vince always wanted a Mighty Mouse character, and that's what Brady Boone was for him. And probably uh, Neville today would be Vince's Mighty Mouse character, is what I can see him looking at. I'm going, God damn. Um, but Ted was a little bit too big to be Mighty Mouse, and then he, he would be an enhancement talent as Ted Petty without the mask and so on. He just, just didn't see it. So Doink the Clown debuts uh, in mid-February on the California Swing. And his uh, first opponent is Bob Backlund. Uh, I want to talk about Backlund in long form someday here on the show. But briefly, whose idea was it to bring him back? Is that a Vince call, a Pat call, or is this just Bob campaigning to come back? Bob Bob and Vince got together, and Vince having a soft spot again for his for his father. And Backlund was, was his dad's champion, felt that he could do something with Bobby bringing him back. And the thought in the back of our mind was, God, do you think we can get a heel run out of Backland? I think that was Vince's vision from the beginning. I know it was mine because I always just saw Bob Backlund being Bob Backlund as a heel because I thought that people shit on him when he when he was a babyface. So it was an opportunity to bring Bob back. He was a big name there. Um. Dave writes that uh, by mid-January, there's only about 3,000 tickets for WrestleMania sold. And he says, if you're coming from out of town, hurry, because there's lots of conventions in town that weekend, and it won't be easy to get a hotel room if you wait. We're going to talk a lot about the decision to kind of roll the dice here in Vegas uh, in a little bit. Uh, By late January, Harvey Whippleman is on TV talking about a big surprise for Kamala. 
And this is kind of the tease of Elegante. I have got to hear more about the signing of Elegante. Of course, he became Giant Gonzalez with you guys. But does Vince see Elegante on WCW and think, I've got to have him? It's funny. When he first saw Elegante on WCW, he thought, oh, my God, they can have him. (laughs) Um, But, of course, when he becomes available and his agent called us and reached out, Vince loves the – the extraordinary talents and to have an eight foot giant. He felt that he could get the most out of El Hicante and he thought that he could get a lot more out of Jose more so than WCW did. And he accepted the challenge and wanted to, wanted to have another giant. Did you just call him Jose? Yeah, I think it was his name. Jose Gonzalez. Am I wrong? Jorge. His name was Jorge. <laughs> Jeez, Jose Gonzalez. <laughs> Wrong guy, folks. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, El Gigante. If I do it in Spanish, is that okay? That's a lot better. Okay. Uh, he also, Dave also reports that there's a major league rumor that Tatanka will be getting the IC title during the summer. Uh, Bruce, we haven't spent enough time on Tatanka on the show yet. You guys pushed him pretty hard when he first came in. Did What did you guys see in him? I mean... I never really got it. I was never a big Tatanka fan, but I had friends who were. I've still got a good friend now who still thinks Tatanka's his, I mean, that's his favorite wrestler ever. What was the long-term plan? Uh, Or or as Meltzer says, did plans change? Well, plans changed. Uh, I don't know that the audience accepted Tatanka as much as, as we wanted them to, obviously. But Native American grapplers have always... They've always had a place in the business. You go back with Wahoo McDaniel, Chief J. Strongbow. I can't believe I actually said Chief J. Strongbow and I said Native American wrestlers. But Jack and Jerry Briscoe and guys like that, that there was a fascination for the Native American athlete. Tatanka is a full Native American, a hell of an athlete, hell of a worker. But there was just something missing, and we were looking at Tatanka. I mean, shit, not just for the Intercontinental Championship. There there was talk, could we make him the WWF champion at some point? But I think that there was just that it factor that was missing with Tatanka. And they they bought him so far. And after that, that that was as far as they would take him. So, yeah, plans changed. In late January, Meltzer reports the WWF is losing at least some television outlets in the last two weeks. He says, quote, I know Omaha is out, so there'll be no future live shows in Nebraska. Ditto Salt Lake City. I mentioned this a little while ago. Kind of explain this process domestically. How do you lose TV? You're not paying for the rights anymore? The contract is up? Well, no, because contrary to popular belief, at that time television stations were paying us to be on the air. So it had changed in the late 80s from a payment system where we used to pay to be on the air that television stations were paying us to have our show. So when they stopped paying, and then all, then they turned back to the old way saying, hey, we want you to pay to be on the air, we decided, well, you know what, we're not going to do that. So That was the instance in a lot of those markets. Obviously, in major markets where we had to be on the air, if they went and did that, we were in trouble, and we would obviously probably still pay to be on the air. But Joe Perkins, who was in charge of the syndication, that was his call. He felt that that was the right thing to do because if you pay one, then all the rest of them are going to turn around and say, hey, wait a minute, what are we paying for? It was also during the time that infomercials were – Yep. Making a big, big play, and that changed the television landscape drastically. So, for them to, for you to be getting paid to do, provide the programming, and now you're losing TV there, is that because they don't feel like they're getting an adequate return? Would that be an indicator that interest was down? Well, it would be simply what was happening is you would have uh, Ron Popeil and the Ronco uh, Vegematic or whatever the hell he was selling at the time offering to pay. $6,000 $6,000 an hour to plug his, to put his infomercial on the air. So we're going to pay, we're paying $6,000 an hour for programming. 
they're delivering us this number. Uh, we're maybe breaking even with advertising, maybe making a little, or we don't have to do shit, and we're going to make six grand. And that was a decision a lot of programmers made. They they went the infomercial route. Crowds were large. We, we decided not to get in the game. Crowds are down here uh, below the thirty thousand dollar level for a lot of weekends, with the exception of big markets like Houston and Nashville. Uh, but most of the numbers are somewhere even in the twenties. Bruce, as long as you'd been with the company at this point, had you seen houses this low in your time, or is this as low as it's been? This was there. This this was low. This was tough because you're out there and you've got guys on tour, and in between you, you're trying. Usually, if your tour is going Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you're making your money Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm, that Thursday show was something to get get you in the groove, and Ed Cohen was throwing darts at at a map, booking everything. You couldn't, if something wasn't doing well in the middle of the tour, it didn't make sense just to cancel it because you're on tour. You, you've got to incur those expenses anyway. But, yeah, business was a shit. Business was, was in the toilet at this point, and we were in a rebuilding phase. It also comes out that Coliseum Video is going to be giving up on the nine ninety nine monthly releases because they weren't getting enough interest from retailers there was a, a long while there where you guys were cranking out Coliseum videos on the regular Invasion 92, Crunch Classic, WrestleFest 92, World Tour 92, Rampage 92. I mean, just lots and lots of stuff to kind of get that content out and get paid for it when there wasn't a pay-per-view happening this month. Uh, who makes the decision to just focus more on pornography at this point? Is that Vince or his partners? <laughs> Well, since Vince didn't focus on pornography or produce <laughs> pornography, um, he wasn't involved in that decision. The, the whole thing with Coliseum Video doing the monthly releases, that was a way to take footage that they already had, repackage it, and put it in an affordable. Because if you go back and you look at the early Coliseum Video releases, man, that shit was like sixty nine ninety five mm-hmm. for a video. And then as videotapes, the, the price came down. I, I remember it was with, I think, the original Batman movie. That that was the first nine ninety nine videotape for a movie, a major motion picture, to come out on video. Before you were paying $69.99, $89.99. Now they're $9.99. We had to compete. So the idea was take footage that we already had, repackage it, and put it out on a $9.99 a month special. There was so much out there that, you know, couldn't need anymore. So they decided just, uh, yeah, let's cut this out. It's not worth it. Maybe not everybody has heard all of our shows in the archives. Why did I make a pornography joke there? Well, because Coliseum Video, the other half of Coliseum Video was uh, Arthur Morowitz and Howard Farber, who owned H&H Video, that produced uh, a great deal of the fine pornography in the world at that time video they, they are the ones who pretty much pioneered the pornography industry from film to video and if you watch the movie movie boogie nights that was kind of based on their life somewhat as far as the video goes Meltzer reports that hogan was interviewed for the george michael sports machine television show and that it was set to air in february uh, he was asked about c- coming back to wrestling, and he says yes. He wanted to come back and get the belt back. He said if he had it to do all over again, he would handle the steroid controversy the exact same way, and he blamed all the problems on the media. And the Rockford Registered Star quoted Hogan by saying, I don't want to just go wrestle. I want to win the belt back. I want to be champion. They've got a guy named Brett the Hitman Hart who's champion now. I could beat him with my eyes closed. He couldn't even lace up my boots. Uh, In the photo, Meltzer notes that uh, Hogan looks much smaller than his wrestling days. He says he's around 270, and uh, he's 6'6 or so and still a huge guy. But uh, Meltzer can't help but notice. It looks like he's lost quite a bit of weight. So, Bruce, this is the first time Hogan has talked about coming back and wanting a title run. 
Do you remember this appearance on the sports machine? Was Hogan already in negotiations with Vince by the time this was taped? Did Vince approve the language or was Hogan just going into business for himself here? I mean, it feels like he's trying to work an angle with Brett, but he'd have to be teasing a heel turn to do so because Brett's clearly a baby face. So it either feels like an angle or just burying a guy. What say you? All the above Hogan going into business for himself and from Hulk's point of view, to defend it, if you're going to come back, why aren't you coming back to be the champion? To to bury a fellow babyface, not the best way to do it. To talk about somebody that can't lace up your boots and then they're the champion, you're not building any value in your champion. You, you want to put them over. I don't agree with that by any stretch of the imagination. So his approach there, that was simply Terry going into business for himself. And we were in negotiations at that point to bring Hulk back. But that was Hulk's way of stirring up some controversy and get people talking. Yokozuna wins the Royal Rumble, of course, uh, after 66 minutes and 35 seconds. And uh, this earns him the title shot at Bret Hart at WrestleMania. Uh, Bruce at 92, of course, Flair won the title in the rumble. So this is the next year. And this is the very first year. The rumble winner would earn a title shot at WrestleMania. Remind everyone again, whose idea that was mine. Uh, Brett wrote in his book, uh, that after the 93 rumble, all the boys were hanging out in the hotel bar and his mom found Dave Meltzer just hanging out in the lobby. So she brings Dave over to meet Brett. Uh, he said Meltzer was polite and nervous because Brett was glaring at him. And then he said to his mom, he's no friend of mine. Do you remember Meltzer coming to events and meeting guys like this? You know, I mean, th- think about that story. He's hanging out, just kind of leering in the lobby, looking at people. I, I remember him and, and Wade Keller in particular is one that I really remember doing that, where they would just kind of hang out in the lobby or hang out on the outskirts of the bar and stare at the boys and try and uh, be on the eerie and eavesdrop on people's conversations and shit like that. Um, Just kind of unsavory. That's my feeling. New Line Cinema announces that they've postponed the release of Mr. Nanny with Hulk Hogan until June. Uh, Meltzer reports it was test marketed in four markets and the results were it didn't do much at the box office. But those who went were almost exclusively kids. So the idea is now to release the movie nationally around the time when kids got out of school. Of course, as we know, the movie was released in October and it flopped with a capital F. Uh, the rumored budget was around $10 million and it drew a little over $4 million at the box office. And it only received a 7% approval rating from Rotten Tomatoes. Bruce, on a scale of 1 to Katie Vick, how bad was Mr. Nanny? I have never seen it. Well, nobody else did either. I think that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, apparently, but uh, no, I'm, I have never seen the movie. Uh, some negative mainstream press regarding the Doink Crush angle in the last two weeks uh, over a couple of newspapers. The New York Daily News uh, wrote, On the flip side of credibility, you have the kind of sleaze only the World Wrestling Federation is capable of generating the toilet bowl Vince McMahon operates has no bottom on Saturday show seen on channel five character Doink the clown attacked wrestler crush from behind with a phony plaster cast with paramedics placing a spine board under crush's back. McMahon gushed about the possibility of crush injuring his neck and vertebra. Considering the seriousness of recent injuries suffered by Dennis bird, The script McMahon was working from could have only been written by an insensitive lowlife concerned only with exploiting the misery of others and all in place to entertain your children. Uh, What a time to be alive when mainstream media is taking an angle like this to task. Dennis Byrd was a Jets football player who was paralyzed during a game And it was a huge deal in the NFL and in America at the time. So if you don't live here or you're a little younger, maybe you don't remember that. But that's what happened. Uh, Bruce, was this Vince capitalizing on a real-life situation to where art could imitate life, so to speak? Uh, Well, first of all, I'd like to point out, fuck Bob Reisman. Okay. And second of all, the business has always been art imitating life. 
but it was not specifically Dennis Bird. It was an angle that we had planned for a long time. The fact that there are similarities, unfortunately, um, if you want to point that out, yeah, but it was not done. Hey, Dennis Bird's paralyzed. Let's do, let's paralyze the guy on TV. Absolutely not. Did Vince secretly enjoy when people would write shit like this about him? I think, you know what, maybe in a sick kind of backward way, you know, you know, any publicity is good publicity, but at the same time, used to piss them off. I know it used to piss me off. Can't nope. they just look at it as the entertainment that it is and get over it, move on? Meltzer reports that Shawn Michaels had showed up to the Royal Rumble with cuts around his eye and required makeup. Uh, we'll cover that shortly. Uh, the Predator, who was the gimmick name for Mike Balea, uh, Hulk's nephew, who we mentioned a minute ago, is now working shots on the road uh, for the WWF, but he's putting Jim Powers over. Um, Dave also reports a lot of news about Hulk that week, saying that the rumor mills out that he's negotiating with WCW, even going so far as to say that Ted Turner had told Jim Hurd that specific thing. Or he's kicking around working with Angelo Poffo on running some shows in Europe. But a lot of folks tend to think that Hulk is actually putting some of these stories out there. Uh, like once upon a time, you know, he was working to deal with Japan, but that seemingly just fell through. Now, the big advantage that WCW could offer Turner hypothetically is if he wanted to do more acting deals because they have more opportunities for that. Was Vince hip? to Hulk's negotiating tactics like this by this time, or did you guys hear this and think, Oh shit, we need to hit the panic button with Hulk. No, it, it was definitely, you just figured that was Hulk being Hulk and Hulk is getting the word out there and trying to get people buzzing, get people talking and using it as a negotiation tactic. So yeah, Vince was definitely hip to it. Shawn Michaels, IRS, Repo Man, Bret Hart, uh, Randy Savage, Mr. Perfect, and others were all filming Family Feud uh, that February. Um, I don't know we'll talk about this again, but who is such a big damn wrestling fan of Family Feud? It seems like they've had a lot of wrestling on over the years. Well, back then it was Ray Combs who was the host of the show after Richard Dawson. Um, Ray Combs and Bobby Heenan were good friends, and Ray was big wrestling fan so the producers had, had reached out to us and and that was the that was the connection at that point in time hulk hogan was reportedly uh seen at the bottom floor of cnn center having uh, a meal at a restaurant there and it even makes it to the atlanta journal constitution and it gets out that he's negotiating a movie deal rather than a wrestling deal but i find that interesting um, and they also confirm that same week in the observer that, uh, Mike Balea is on the road full time for the WWF as a preliminary wrestler and that Brutus, the barber beefcake would be returning to Monday night raw on February 1st. So is this appearance at CNN center, just another negotiating tactic at the very last minute in your opinion? I believe it was actually just coincidental because Hulk was talking to people about some of the different movie deals and television deals that he had, because by this time it, it was, a, it was done and he was coming back and we were doing the deal at WrestleMania. Hogan I think was, this was more coincidental and, and it was simply everybody making, making much ado about nothing, but it was great for publicity. Uh, Hogan was reportedly, uh, visiting the Titan offices that Thursday and, uh, the WWF didn't of course confirm or deny anything, which was standard issue back then. Uh, and it was reported on the, the New York daily news on January 29th, that Hogan would be returning at WrestleMania. So let's get specific about timelines here. What caused Hogan to be someone that you guys were like, we got to get him back. There's rumor and innuendo out there that you guys wait until you get the Royal Rumble preliminary buy rate, and then you panic a little, and then you kind of pivot to Hogan and want his involvement. Maybe not at that point to win the world title, but just to be on the card. And, hey, on second thought, we don't want to do a WrestleMania without him. Our buy rate was down for the Rumble. We need to call an audible. Is that how you remember it? 
No, that's not. The idea was when Hulk was looking for something, and this was probably, it was after we had made the switch with Brett, and it would have been late November, December time frame, that there was discussions about him coming back. And having one last run, we were going to be doing a, we were planning an international tour in UK and Germany, I believe. But the idea was, well, damn, you know, Hulk wants to come back, kind of have one last hurrah, and then he's got another movie coming up. What can we do? And we threw out a bunch of different ideas. There were uh, <laughs> there were things pitched, including having Hulk come back and work with Dustin Rhodes and bringing Dustin in from WCW as Dustin and as a heel to work a program with Hulk. Um, that was pitched. Hulk didn't like that too much. But there were a lot of things, and there were discussions probably, I'm, I want to say early December, late November of the previous year is when everything started, just talking about Hulk coming back. Man, that's so fuck. It wasn't, it wasn't a reaction to, to Royal Rumble. We had in the back of our mind. Now, Hulk winning the championship, that was all kind of an afterthought. That was We'll get there. That was after that. Uh, what, a, what a fucking cool tidbit that is about Dustin Rhodes, though. I had not heard that. Uh, chat me up about, uh, Mike Balea, the nephew. This is just a goodwill gesture. Is this something Hogan asks for, or does the guy smart enough to just leverage it on his own? Oh no, this was a favor to Hulk. Hulk asked to help out his, his nephew. And so we did, we told him we'd take a look at him, put him on the road and give him a few paydays. And that was that, but there wasn't anything there. Uh, so the WWF holds a press conference on January 27th in Las Vegas with a couple hundred folks there. Uh, and they announced the three top matches as Undertaker versus Giant Gonzalez, Lex Luger versus Mr. Perfect, and Bret Hart versus Yokozuna. And Meltzer reports that Hart made some uh, negative comments about Flair, calling him overrated at the press conference. Uh, would that have been something that Vince would have asked Brett to do just to disparage Rick since he's on his way out and debuting with WCW or is this Brett's real life feelings just coming out? I think it's Brett's real life feelings because Vince's philosophy was always don't mention the other guy. Don't bring him up. So I think it was Brett kind of, Rick was outspoken. And here's the funny thing. This, this was always one I never really understood was the animosity between Brett and Rick. Because in my mind, I would think two great workers with seemingly the same principles and views of the business, I would have thought they would have been the best buds. But they always seemed to kind of like, you know, pick at each other. And I think that this in particular was Brett's answer to some of the comments that Rick had made about Brett and this was Brett's opportunity in a public forum to, to say something. No, Hey man, you know, there's a lot of big things coming up and everybody wants to be involved. Everybody wants to be participating and connected to their favorite superstars. Well, stat hero can actually be a part of your life and get you that connection that you've always wanted. Stat Hero is the company that revolutionized sports gaming by making winning consistently on your sports action a reality. And they brought their innovative gameplay to allow real money gaming on pro wrestling. All right, that's unheard of, and that's a game changer. I've said it before. And for the first time ever, you can play for real money contests on grappling, pro wrestling. I, I know what you're thinking. How? I mean, the matches are predetermined, aren't they? I mean, people know. Well, with Stat Hero, that just doesn't matter because Stat Hero has gamified the most exciting aspects of the matches so that the action in the ring dictates who wins. It's not the outcome of the match. So get this, all right? If somebody hits someone with a foreign object, that's two and a half points. Uh, a power move, that's two points. Come off the top rope. For whatever it is, elbow, whatever, man, five points. If your wrestler earns the most points, then guess what? You win. Who's going to nominate? Is it going to be your fan favorite or is it going to be someone that everybody hates? It's 
a game and you can actually win real money. Uh, contest consists of wrestlers across multiple matches. Um, imagine this. Wrestling, fantasy, plus real money action. Add it all up and it's a win-win for you. Now, you want to hear a real win-win? Stat Hero will match your first play. Dollar for dollar. Win or lose up to $100. Nothing to lose and no reason not to try. Go to StatHero.com. That is StatHero.com and download the app today. Now, restrictions apply. See StatHero.com for details. But visit StatHero right now and download the app. Uh, after the negative press in the daily news, the crush doink angle was toned down for TV and there was no indication at either TV taping, uh, that there was even an angle and on television in the past week, they kind of indicated that crush was fine and that the injury wasn't that bad. And he'd be back in a couple of weeks. Allegedly the original idea was that crush would be held out for a long time. In your opinion, Bruce does. Dave have that right or did and Titan change plans uh, as a reaction to the paper or is that all just made up bullshit? That's made up bullshit because that actually uh, right after that is when I went to Hawaii and shot crush vignettes. So we, we had the idea that we wanted to bring him back at WrestleMania, um, probably brought him back on TV sooner than we anticipated but Vince, you know, would always got to, you know, hated reacting to that kind of shit, to negative press, because in my opinion, then they win. But it was just a way to kind of smooth that over. So next up, Dave has an update for us on the Ultimate Warrior. He says Warrior's telling people he doesn't want to wrestle anymore. So instead, he's going to work on his martial arts, his weaponry, and his horseback riding. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's, that, that, because, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's like alleging that he was horseback riding before. So this is something he's just going to work on now. Because he's going to uh, break into action movies, and Warrior's agent is asking for five grand a shot plus uh, first class airfare for a card show. So, what say you? Uh, <laughs> what action movies would Warrior have been great in? Oh God! Slow motion action movies. I fuck. Are you ribbing me? No. Where do you get this shit from? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you saying that it's not true, or that it's preposterous that Warrior would consider that a real option? None of that. It's just, it's just preposterous to bring it up. That this I. I don't know. Maybe he did. I don't have a clue. I just think it's funny that he's going to work on his martial arts and his horseback riding. That just kind of tickled me a little bit. I get Warrior working on martial arts. I get him, you know, doing some boxing, doing some kickboxing, trying some judo. I get it. Uh, <laughs> the idea of the ultimate warrior <laughs> horseback riding or playing with nunchucks in his backyard fucking owns me. Destrucity, baby. I feel like he's uh, Napoleon Dynamite in his backyard here. Uh, uh, at the end of uh, the at the end of the month, uh, January that is, you guys do a Headlock on Hunger show, and it draws about twelve thousand folks to Madison Square Garden. And somewhere in here, Bret Hart brings out a giant hundred thousand dollar check to present to the Red Cross. And this has everybody, uh, all the heels, all the faces, everybody. Um, and me and Gene even mentioning uh, Vince and Linda, Pat, Tony, JJ, Sarge. This is at, at a time and place when business is down for the company. Doesn't a $100,000 donation here seem out of place? Or are you doing some of this and specifically in this market to overcome some of the negativity that's running in the paper? Sure. I mean, it, even when business is down, you can give to charity and help out. So, yeah, it's a goodwill, goodwill call. 
It comes out that Mr. Perfect blew his knee out in Boston on February 6th, uh, working with Razor Ramon and actually spent the night in the hospital and then was on crutches all day Sunday uh, and then had somebody take his place. Does this feel like when it rains, it pours since Perfect was penciled in and a featured spot at Mania? Was there any, you know, ever any doubt that he wouldn't make the show? God, yes. I mean, it seemed like every time we would take two steps forward, we would end up taking three steps back. It was frustrating, and it it felt like the show was snake bit. But you just got to keep, you got to put your head down and keep plowing forward and hope for the best. But we really didn't know. So you just kind of crossed your fingers and prayed. Um, they report that uh, high energy is going to be broken up, uh, and that, uh, Coco was injured at a TV taping and then helped to the dressing room. Uh, and then Brett made the save, uh, to help Owen. So this set up, uh, money Inc and Brett and Owen in some tag matches. And then they had some singles matches with Owen, even beating Shawn Michaels, who was the intercontinental champion. Uh, and Owen would continue this singles run. But ultimately, he got hurt in a match against Bam Bam, and that match was actually filmed and aired, uh, so you can go back and see that. It was a pretty good match. Why didn't we see, or if we would have seen Owen healthy at WrestleMania, who would it have been against? I don't know. Maybe it, it might have been Sean, but I... I remember the Owen experiment, if you want to call it, but breaking Owen away because Brett as the champion was a great opportunity to springboard Owen out of that. And the injury just cut it short. So there was never really any time to develop anything. And that's pretty much all there was to it. We, we didn't get into that Owen project until he came back after the fact. That's a shame. I would have liked to have seen Owen work a singles match on this pay-per-view. Uh, Channel 13 in Los Angeles refused to air the Yokozuna Jim Duggan match we talked about earlier. Uh, it was supposed to air on Superstars, but they didn't allow it. And they didn't because of heavy protests from the AAPAA, which is the Association of Asian Pacific American Artists, the Japanese American Citizen Leagues, and the Media Action Network for Asian Americans. A KTTV spokesperson said the station refused to air the match because, quote, we're not in the business of perpetuating stereotypes. Uh, when contacted, a representative from Titan claimed to n- have not seen the match but said it would never be the company's intention to offend anyone. Uh, someone from AAPAA saw a tape of the match and said the scenes and commentary promoted very negative images of Asians and promoted Japan bashing. Uh, they made it into an East and West type of thing, she says. Uh, She complained that the comments about Fuji and Yokozuna being sneaky and underhanded perpetuates hate. The general American population is being educated wrong on who we are. Uh, Titan would say that Yokozuna had been very well received by fans, but he was brought in and defended his company, saying the WWF has another Japanese wrestler, Tenru, who is a good guy. Uh, The TV station said that all future matches of Yokozuna will be monitored and the decisions as to whether or not they would air them would be made on a case-by-case basis. When the show aired on Saturday, it was interrupted by Lord Alfred Hayes, who said because of the graphic nature of the match, it couldn't air, and they put a rerun of the Flair hitting Loser Leafs Town match in its place. As a reminder, this is the match where Duggan juice from the mouth, and it was heavily pushed as U.S. versus Japan, and they were going to kind of continue that theme for the WrestleMania main event with Bret Hart, which is kind of funny since Bret isn't American. Uh, Bruce, let's remember. Actually, he is. He's got dual citizenship. You know what I mean, fuckhead. Uh, let's remember now we are two years removed from Sergeant Slaughter being a fucking Iraqi sympathizer. So let's not act like we're above this shit in the WWF. But do you remember this backlash specifically? Uh, from the Japanese community or the Asian community about Yokozuna. So what was the name of this person that made this complaint? Uh, Who cares? Exactly. Um, Fuck them. Again, did they complain at the movie Pearl Harbor? Did they complain about Saturday Night Live with the samurai warrior that John Belushi portrayed? It's entertainment. It is America versus the rest of the world. 
it's to me that kind of shit is absolutely just silly. There's heels and baby faces, and if people can't see the difference, then you're taking life too seriously. Get the fuck over it and move on. That's all I got to say about that. But again, it, it was the wrestling business and it was taking national patriotism. And yes, it was an old stereotype. Sure it was, but so are the movies in, in Hollywood when they portray in their movies, uh, it's just silly to me. Absolutely silly. Uh, was Vince, especially, especially coming out of Los Angeles. Was Vince comfortable with this? Was he comfortable with what? The backlash. I mean, does he hear this and think, well, this is good for business or what's the attitude from Vince? Well, the, the fact, yeah, shit. We promoted the fuck out of it. That these assholes in Los Angeles didn't want to air this because of, because of this, we promoted it. Uh, Marty Gennetti was fired at the San Jose tapings. He was asleep in the dressing room. He claimed he was sleeping, but apparently others felt it was more like passed out. And there was some heat uh, amongst the wrestlers on Ray Stevens, who reported it, because the belief was that Stevens was once a wrestler and all the boys should stick together. Bruce, before we talk about Marty, how was Ray Stevens as an office guy? It's hard for me to imagine, given the stories I've heard about Ray over the years. Ray had a hard time as a agent, producer. Ray's one of those guys that could do it all. He could cut a great promo. He could go in the ring and have the best match on the card every single night. But he had a difficult time explaining how to do that to talent, how to produce talent to get the best out of them. So Ray was having a difficult time making the transition from the ring uh, to behind the scenes. He had worked for Vern Gagne behind the scenes a little bit prior to coming in to the WWF. And it, and we brought him in thinking that his knowledge in the ring would be a great asset. Um, it just didn't work out. He didn't have the ability to explain what he wanted to people and, and get that out of them. But I do remember the incident and Ray had a hard time with Marty. I think there was a little bit more to it than Marty being asleep in the locker room. I think there were words exchanged between Marty and Ray, and and that was more of it, Marty threatening an office employee and things of that nature. But there was an argument with them, and Vince sided with, with Ray on that one. Spencer reports that Mike Ortman, who worked for Titan a few years back, was rehired and named vice president of syndicated television. Bruce, what does this job entail? Who the hell is Mike? Why did he leave the first time, and why is he back now? Mike Ortman, great guy. Great guy. Um, way too nice to be in the wrestling business. But Mike Ortman was the protege and the office guy for Joe Perkins, who Joe Perkins was the original syndicator for Vince's syndicated television product. And what he did was he contacted television stations across the nation to place the WWE programming throughout the country. This was during a time that uh, Joe Perkins was taking a lesser role, wanted to step back. And Mike Ordman had originally left the company for a different position where he could grow in a new company because he felt that he would never replace Joe Perkins. And now all of a sudden Joe was, was leaving and Joe was going to be taking a lesser role. And we just felt that Mike was the perfect guy to replace him. So he was going to be handling all the syndicated and dealing with all the stations across the nation and across the world, handling those deals. Uh, it comes out that some enhancement guys aren't wanting to take the Frankensteiner from Scott Steiner after uh, a few early matches had enhancement guys on the loop messing the spot up. So in some of these matches, a Beverly brother slaps on a hood and he takes it. Do you remember any problems with the Frankensteiner when it was first being done in the WWF? No, not that I can remember. Uh, I do remember uh, the Beverly brothers because they took it great. <laughs> um, they had good matches with the Steiners, so... That might have been an issue, but I don't remember that specifically, to tell you the truth. Meltzer says the Chicago station didn't air the Yokozuna Duggan match either due to the anti-Japanese commentary. 
And then Phil Mushnick from the New York Post piles on and writes an article on February 15th being very critical of the angle. And in return, uh, he takes the New York station and the USA Network to air, to task as well as uh, the WWF. So now the anti-Japanese rhetoric starts to be toned down a little bit in the syndicated shows the following week. Bruce, describe Phil Mushnick in a few words and do it as Vince McMahon, please. Fucking asshole. Uh, European houses were huge here, including two houses in London and Dortmund, Germany, uh, in excess of $340,000. Bruce, at the time, there's nothing comparable in the United States. What would you attribute the WWF's popularity in Europe to? And why was it so much greater there than it was here? Because we weren't running it every two months or every month. And fond, you know, separation makes the hell uh, the heart grow fonder. So the fact that we were only going there once, maybe twice a year, we did great business. So simply that we had saturated the the market so much that God, they, they were sick of us. Oh, internationally, we would only go a couple times a year. They were happy to see us. The local newspaper in Portland runs an item on Doink being Matt Bourne, calling him a former high school football and wrestling star at Milwaukee High. Uh, And I'm told about 75% of the fans in the building knew Doink was Bourne. Bourne's father, Tony Bourne, was a legendary wrestler in the circuit in the 60s and still a name everyone in the city knows. That's straight from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Bruce, were you guys not hot at the paper for writing this about Bourne? or, Or at this point... Was it more acceptable to Vince for you to just kind of out gimmicks like this? Kind of a little bit of both. I think that it, it was taken as, well, that shit's going to happen. But it was also like, damn it. Why did that get out? So it's a double-edged sword. You're happy they're writing about you, but it's one market. Get over it. Um. Meltzer reports that Hogan set to debut on the February 22nd edition of Monday Night Raw at the Manhattan Center. And he says the deal is apparently where Hogan will work all pay-per-views and then a few other major shows, which would include a newly announced March 7th Fox Network live special from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, he says Hogan's presence uh, is probably what helped getting in getting this special since the last Fox special, which was right before Survivor Series, bombed in the ratings. Uh, He also says there will be at least one more pay-per-view show back at it again this coming year. Now that Hogan's back in the fold, we know that would become King of the ring. Uh, Bruce, do you recall there being any sort of talk about Hogan being critical to getting this Fox special landed again? No, because the Fox special had already been in the works. It certainly helped having Hogan a part of it, but it was already in the works. Uh, Bret Hart wrote this about Hogan coming back quote, Uh, When I read my booking shoots, I realized I'd see Hulk at TVs in North Charleston, South Carolina on March 8th. Even though he'd been making the odd appearance on various shows since December, I hadn't laid eyes on him since WrestleMania 8 when I'd given him his drawing. I really thought he'd be proud of me, so when I pulled up to the back of the arena, I went looking for him. I didn't have to look far. He was standing chatting with Beefcake, leaning against the wall on the ramp. His appearance had changed drastically. He looked like a lean old walrus. He was tanned and wore red spandex tights, big white boots, and a bandana covering his balding head. I approached with a huge smile, and my hand extended in friendship. Hogan gave me a dismissive nod and wouldn't shake my hand. I withdrew it and walked away. I figured that because I was champion now, he saw me as the competition. Hulkamania had run so wild that it burned itself out like a grass fire, and here I was, one of the new, brightly colored flowers popping up to haunt him. Do you remember them having a kind of a cold interaction at a TV? Well, I obviously didn't witness that. And knowing Hulk for 30 plus years, I've just never known him to be that kind of a dick like that to other guys. Even, even if there was heat, he would still, Hey, how you doing brother? He's not like that these days. I've seen him in 14, 15, 16, He's not like that at all. Um, uh, there's some stuff in the observer here that I had to cut out just for the sake of time. Uh, that is really, there's just so much going on 
you know, during these months leading to WrestleMania 9. Stuff like, and I'm sure we'll cover all this eventually, the WWF suing Nails, and then later Geraldo, Kerry Von Erich being brought up on cocaine charges and then ultimately committing suicide, and then Andre the Giant dying kind of unexpectedly. Uh, we'll get to all these topics in the future, I'm sure, but I, I couldn't add it in to an already ridiculously long WrestleMania 9 show without it being 11 hours this week. Uh, the WWF, obviously, needless to say here, has had a lot of legal problems during this time. Okay, I've been looking forward to this. This is a weird story here to me, Bruce. Uh, it involves Jim Ross. Dave wrote that even though JR was under contract to WCW, he had Vince, Bobby Heenan, and Shawn Michaels on his radio show at WSB in Atlanta to promote WrestleMania. So you've got a WCW announcer having WWF guys on his Atlanta radio show to promote WrestleMania. On that show, Vince announces that Ross will be joining the WWF as their lead announcer, and he somehow compared this to John Madden switching networks, saying Christmas came early. Uh, Ross says that his show the following week will actually be a WrestleMania simulcast. And Dave writes that WCW had claimed that Ross is under contract here, and they want Ross to sign a five-year non-compete for the radio show, saying that he won't do another radio show in Atlanta for wrestling for at least five years. And apparently WCW wants the time with the station and hopes to put Tony Schiavone in that spot. I'd put some butts in the seats, but Dave believes that, uh, Ross, um, had done an announcing tryout already in Stanford weeks prior to this, and even visited the, you guys at a taping in August. And he suspects that if they're this far along that McMahon and Ross have pretty confidently discovered a legal loophole strong enough to make the announcement and for Ross to make the jump. I didn't know all of this before I did my research. How did this come about with Jim Ross jumping? What do you remember about his WCW contract and this radio station controversy? Okay. Well, first of all, as usual, Meltzer's wrong. JR contacted me. I remember where I was to this day. As a matter of fact, Jim Ross and I discussed it recently talking about his book. Jim called the office, asked for me. I was in the second floor training room with Vince and Pat Patterson, and I took the call. Jim informed me that his WCW contract was coming up and wanted to know if there was any interest. I said, I would, I would ask and find out. I said, but, you know, we can't talk to you if you're under contract. He says, no, I've, I've got room where I can talk. So we exchanged all the proper paperwork that needed to be done. I asked Vince and we talked about Jr. what kind of guy he is and what kind of asset he would be to the company. And we got together. Jim came to a television taping in Augusta, Georgia, met with Vince. Practically the entire damn night, they stood outside by the trucks and, and met and talked. And uh, we decided to bring JR on. But JR was not officially under contract at that time to WCW. They had. There was a clause in the contract where Jr. could negotiate. His contract was either up or getting ready to be up. And the deal with the radio station where Jim was was not tied to Turner, best of my knowledge. That was something that Jim Ross had secured on his own. So we did it, announced it, and we also did the deal to simulcast WrestleMania on there. That had nothing to do with WCW. Well, all right. Uh, what was it about Ross that uh, Vince liked so well? His excitement, the way that he brought you into the match, the way that he told stories. And it, it's funny, all of the things that Vince liked about JR so much in the beginning is what he would later criticize in, in later years about JR. Isn't that amazing? It is. And. and Jim brought an excitement and brought an intensity to everything that you were watching. And I think he was one of the best play-by-play -play guys in the business. Uh, just as a frame of reference, Sean Mooney was on his way out here around the same time too, right? Yeah. Sean had gotten an offer to do, I believe Boston. He got an offer to do the uh, anchor spot in Boston news station. So he was moving on. 
Uh, it's reported that Razor Ramon's bad knee got worse during the week, even suffering a staph infection. Uh, and he's just uh, working hurt as much as he can, and they're trying to cover it with him working tags. But they're saying that Ted DiBiase, who had had a neck issue, and Shawn Michaels, who had had a shoulder separation, are said to be ready. And this is by late February. Was there any concern that Razor wouldn't be able to go? And from an injury standpoint, does this show seem snake bit? You've got Owen hurt. Ted's been hurt. Sean's been hurt. Razor's hurt. Perfect's hurt. It feels like fucking everybody's hurt. And of course we know, uh, Hulk Hogan shows up with a black eye. Do you remember this being just, uh, what the fuck else can happen feeling from a roster injury standpoint? Yeah. They're dropping like flies. <laughs> I mean, damn, we we were waiting for Yokozuna to, to stub his toe, not be able to walk to the ring. It, it just was one thing after another. And it, didn't seem like there was any end in sight. Meltzer said as they headed into the show, um, he expected it to be the highest buy rate and highest grossing wrestling event of the year, but he thought it was a pretty safe bet that it would be the lowest buy rate ever for a WrestleMania, even with the return of Hulk Hogan. You guys kind of expected that going into the show, though. Did you know it? We did. We knew that we were in a rebuilding phase, and we were willing to accept uh, houses that weren't where we felt they should be. And we buy rates that maybe weren't as big as they used to be, but we were in a rebuilding phase. And just remind me when we get into this at the end of the, at the end of the show, we start talking about the Brett Yoko match and Hulk is, is to why we felt comfortable with that in the buy rate. Uh, John Gonzalez and Harvey Whippleman make an appearance on Regis and Kathy Lee, uh, plugging, uh, as a, like a last minute push for WrestleMania. And Dave says that there are far fewer appearances as far as general media publicity and public interest than there had been for any previous WrestleMania. Would you agree or disagree with that for WrestleMania nine? I would agree with that. It was also the first WrestleMania that we didn't have any outside celebrities either. Yeah. Uh, it's important to mention here that right before WrestleMania, Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart are in England promoting Hulk Hogan's movie, Mr. Nanny. Uh, Bruce, I'm asking the armchair quarterback here a little bit, but was Hogan going overseas to promote this considered a good thing since it was mainstream or are we kind of focusing on the wrong thing at the wrong time here? It was actually twofold. It was to promote Mr. Nanny. It was also to promote his live event tour that was coming up there in the next month as well. So it was good on all fronts. All right. We're finally here. Let's talk about the actual event. Now that we've been rolling for well over an hour, uh, WrestleMania nine, according to the polls in the wrestling observer newsletter, they got a total of 12% of thumbs up 12.8%, I guess 78% thumbs down and a 9.2% thumbs in the middle. The unanimous best match is Shawn Michaels and Tatanka followed by the head shrinkers and Steiners. And the worst match is Bob Backlund and Razor Ramon, followed by Undertaker and Giant Gonzalez. Uh, Do you agree with those as the best match and the worst match, Bruce? So 800 800 people out of millions that watched it wrote in today, Meltzer, and this is their opinion. 800 people. Well, I mean, what did you – so you disagree? You think it was a thumbs-up show? I thought the show was good. I thought the show was entertaining. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Best match, Shawn Michaels versus Tatanka. Uh, I thought that was a great match. Worst uh, match, Bob Backlund, Razor Ramon. You agree? I thought the worst match was probably Hogan and Beefcake and Money, Inc. It was the fucking longest, that's for sure. It was horrible. I think you'll agree with this, though. Meltzer- I, actually, I, I'm going to take that back. Taker, Taker, and Giant Gonzalez. Taker to this day hasn't forgiven us for that. After the poll, Dave writes a long editorial about how the wrestling business, uh, much like a lot of entertainment business, has a lot of folks who are really good at their craft and maybe even better than others who live permanently in the shadow of more charismatic people without the same level of talent. And he kind of says that that's the situation here because. Hulk Hogan is a proven draw and the WWF needs his box office juice just to maintain its position in the entertainment world. 
So he feels like Hogan has a lot of bargaining chips on his side as to what he gets and when he picks his spot to return. And uh, even though the majority of the reaction was pretty negative about the direction changed, Dave agrees it was the right move for business this summer. And you could argue that it was the only move you could make short term. Uh, But others would say, well, you need to be building long term. So I know you well enough to know that you agree with all of that. So just state that clearly for the record. Repeat after me. I, Bruce Pritchard, agree with everything Meltzer wrote here. No, I, I agree with part of it. What do you disagree with? Part that it was it, it was what needed to be done, and it was but it was what needed to be done for the international tour, and it was the right move. Do you, you realize how stupid that sounds when you say it out loud? Well, that's what it was. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. We did it so Hogan would be the champion on the international tour. Why'd you need that? Because it was his last raw overseas. No, it gives a fuck. Sure they did. Different right. time, different place. Let's run through that. You just spent the last hour telling me how fucking over Bret Hart was internationally and how huge he was in Europe. So if that's the case, why the fuck do you need Hulk Hogan? It was over as Bret was, Hogan was over more. And it was Hogan's it was Hogan's farewell tour. And it didn't happen. What do you mean it didn't happen? Well, he left right. I mean, he wasn't the champ. He lost it to King of the Ring. I, but before that was the international tour. That was right that, after but, WrestleMania is when we did the international tour. And that was Hogan as the champion. Then Hogan came back at King of the Ring and dropped it to Yoko. But it was Hogan's farewell UK tour. That was the whole reasoning behind it. So all that stuff earlier about Bret Hart being huge. Walking on water, he was huge. So th- they had a $320,000 gate before they even went, before WrestleMania, but you felt like you needed Hulk Hogan. Do you, I mean, do you realize how dumb that sounds? No, I don't think it sounds dumb at all. It, it add, it's adding even more value to it and allow you to raise prices. And If the tickets are already out, sold, how, how are you raising Hulk. prices? You raise prices with Hulk Hogan and just added more value. Give him something else. Uh, I, the ticket's already sold. But you're adding value. I, I, how can you raise prices to something where the ticket's already sold? Well, you raise prices with Hogan going over. Listen, you stupid fuck. There value. aren't any tickets no, there. Listen, we if added the tic- value after the fact. You bought your tickets. Now you got Hulk Hogan, right? Yeah, so the people show up with their ticket so and they say, up, well, so you bought it. You, with- all, you get Hogan as champion, which is what they wanted to see. I understand. And that's what we gave them. But you're saying you raise prices. We did initially raise prices, yeah, with Hogan's return. But the t- I just said that you already had the gate. Like, you do this right. I didn't know you were talking about the tour the next week because that makes even fucking less sense because you've already had the tickets on sale. True, but we wanted to give them added value and have Hulk tour as the champion. Why does that matter if you've already because sold that's three? That's what Vince wanted. There's the answer. I'll take that one. Stop with all your other shenanigan bullshit well, that no, doesn't make any sense. Reason, you want the reasoning behind it. I'm giving you the well, reasoning. Well, we can raise prices. It. How do you raise prices from that already sold? Give me more raise money. Prices at the beginning. Give me, you give me more money, do, do, do. That's what I do. I make money. How could you raise prices in the beginning if they don't know that Hogan's going to be champion? Well, you knew Hogan was going to be there. You give them added value by him being there as champion. So you put the tickets. Got a championship match. This is so dumb. <sighs> Let's talk about something else we can argue about. Um, Meltzer wrote, as for the show itself, it's hard to make an argument. This was worth the twenty nine ninety five. With the poor lighting, uh, the show lacked visual impressiveness a mega show should have. It certainly lacked the wrestling action. The majority of the matches were bad. And none were the excellent, memorable type matches one expects to see at the so-called biggest show of the year. Bruce, why Las Vegas? I've always been curious about this destination. It didn't have a huge population then. It wasn't a major metro where you could pull from. It's very much a destination city. This feels like the first time you guys have tried something like that. 
I mean, compare that to the previous year and you guys were in fucking Indianapolis. I mean, who goes to Indianapolis to vacation? Is this the first time you guys made a conscious effort to make WrestleMania a fly in and why Las Vegas? Because no matter what anybody says, it wasn't then. And it's not now family friendly and they'll try to convince you otherwise, but I mean, it, it, they have rolling billboards on the street where they send gr- girls directly to your room. So that's not a family-friendly Disneyland situation. Why Vegas? I think Vegas from the standpoint of, and again, when you look at Las Vegas and then there is the allure of Los Angeles and a huge metropolis. That's your next biggest metropolis that would make that jaunt over to vegas but you also had a lot less tickets to sell and we did it in the stadium adjacent to caesar's palace where they'd had a lot of boxing matches it was yeah it was a destination event it was something different and the feeling behind it was you draw you you go to a stadium you've got to lower your ticket prices in a stadium to sell seventy thousand sixty thousand ninety thousand however many tickets If you go to a smaller arena, and in particular, if you go to Vegas and you're going to do it at Caesars Palace, Caesars was looking to pay top dollar for a lot of those tickets to give out to their high rollers. That's a double-edged sword because they're buying the high dollar tickets. You're getting your money on the gate, but then you've got a lot of people that are there that are sitting on their hands that have no investment in the storylines, that have no idea what the hell's going on in the ring or care. It kills your television presentation. It kills the atmosphere completely. But, hey, it was money. It was a guaranteed gate. Caesars was a great partner. And they were looking to, you know, it was at a time where, we were looking for that guaranteed house and it was a way to do something different. It was also something which I, I don't think, uh, I know Pat and I fought (laughs) tremendously about this with Vince, because as I said before, there wasn't any celebrity interaction. And this was during the time that Vince felt, God damn it. The WWF are the celebrities. Our stars are the celebrities. I just felt it, it it didn't have the panache of prior WrestleManias. It was Caesars, you add to that, the ambience outside, half of it daylight, you know, and then the, the sunset later on. It just didn't didn't have a WrestleMania feel to me. It had a special event feel because it looked different and it was big, but it didn't have the panache of of WrestleMania to me. This is a major departure uh, from the previous year. Do you think Vince having to cancel the Coliseum at seven, that he just had a hard on to run a big dome and he ran the Hoosier dome against his better judgment for eight. And then somehow he sort of came to his senses of where the business really was and then decided to run the smaller venue, but with higher ticket prices for nine. Well, for not the, the big push was, and I remember sitting in the meeting with Basil DeVito talking about how, why a smaller building, Basil was always for running the smaller buildings. Instead of going and doing a stadium, man, run all state arena and get a thousand dollars for ringside. You'll, you'll do better and it will create a larger demand for your pay-per-view. That was, that was the difference in, in promotion and going for the buck versus Vince's thing of creating a, a spectacle, spectacle that people will pay money and that you'll have forever to, to, is a show place to go and brag about. We did X amount of people. We set an attendance record and, and what have you. Basil's thing was all about he came from the NBA. So it was about, man, just you raise your prices and you make that event the event so hard to get tickets for so hard. If you're there, man, you're somebody special and it puts a premium on it. But what that also did was it removed your real fan from that experience, from being able to participate in that experience. And that's something that, that Vince always wanted that, that we would fight for trying to keep 
the average fan a part of that event. Here you are with some of that old bullshit again. If that was really the case, why did you guys do casino buys? Now, for those of you who are listening who don't really keep up with the business side of things in Las Vegas, if you have a big UFC or a big boxing match, like whenever Floyd Mayweather fights or Manny Pacquiao fight, uh, the casinos buy up a large portion of them. And that's the reason an MGM Grand would want to host it there because they want to invite their big whales in and say, hey, come gamble with us this weekend. We'll comp you fight tickets and we'll comp your room. The idea being, if we can get a guy who's going to get out here and bet $10,000 a hand on blackjack, we'll give him the room and some fight tickets and he'll lose $100,000. So we more than make our money up. So the casinos would gobble up a lot of those pricier tickets. Well, if you're really concerned about the real fan, you don't do any of those shenanigans. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. And, and that this was a departure in that regard. And that was where the difference was, where Vince wanted to lean more towards the fan friendly. And, and he, he gave in. He was looking, you know, we look for the payday here. And that's what we did. And this was a situation where the casino did gobble up a lot of the, the main seats, the good seats. And we got people that didn't give a shit about what was in the ring. Man, I just love talking to you guys about chilly sleep. I am sleeping better than ever, and I know I'm enjoying a better quality of life, all because I get a good night's sleep. I got to give you guys a peek behind the curtain. A few years ago, pre-chilly sleep, I was sleeping like five, maybe six, sometimes seven, but very rarely seven hours a night. But that wasn't even continuous sleep. I was fussing with the covers, fighting with the pillows. I was up and down, tossing and turning. I was trying to get comfortable. I had a ceiling fan in my bedroom. I would crank down that AC. I would kick a leg out from underneath the covers. I was doing whatever I could to not be hot because I knew I slept better when I was cool. Well, it turns out I was right. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering our core body temperature. You see, temperature controlled sleep repairs your muscles after a hard day's work and it improves your cognitive function. So you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Now, Sleep Me is the new home for Chili Sleep. Sleep Me is bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offered, but under a new name. Chili Sleep makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets your body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deep, more restorative sleep. Chili Sleep makes the Uller, the Cube, and the Doc Pro Sleep System. All three are water based, temperature controlled mattress toppers. Let me explain. They fit over your existing mattress and they provide you your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep sleep, cold sleep. You see, Sleep Me is designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. I'm jealous of this. I've got the Uller, but they just launched the brand new Doc Pro Sleep System. I can't wait to try it. It has two times more cold power than their other models. It's whisper quiet, and it has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Why not pair it with the new sleep.me app? That's going to give you like uh, think of it as almost like a smart thermostat for your phone. My wife has her side of the bed automated. She wants to climb into a warm bed, but she wants to uh, drop that temperature as she starts to fall asleep. So she doesn't get all hot and sweaty and she gets that deep sleep. But then she has her side of the bed automatically set to warm her up, to wake her up. How about that for sleep scheduling? Head on over to sleep.me forward slash wrestle to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for something to wrestle with listeners, and it's only for a limited time, y'all. That's sleep, S L E E P dot M E slash wrestle to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Let's talk about uh, the theme. Who wanted this theme? Is this Vince's idea? And I mean, you guys spent a lot of attention to detail, expense, time, all that setting this shit up. Carry me through the thought process. Fuck the celebrities. We'll show them how to put on a show. That was his thing, man. It was, we were going to make this a spectacle in and of ourselves. We were going to decorate that Coliseum to look like a Roman Coliseum. We were going to use, uh, Cleopatra and Caesar himself. The animals, the camel, the elephants, all that shit to make this huge spectacular around the WWF and WrestleMania. So that that was the idea behind it. It was, we'll show them. 
Um, tell me some fun animal stories. I feel like there's got to be one. You guys have a giant fucking elephant there, which is so dangerous. I mean, that elephant could kill everyone in the crowd if it wanted to. Uh, and you guys have that giant elephant and the bird with the undertaker and the camel with Bobby Heenan. There's lots of craziness going on. Uh, any interesting animal shenanigans you can tell us about? Bobby, he- Bobby Heenan riding the camel. That was Bobby's idea to get on the damn thing backwards. And, and everybody was against it because they were afraid that he was going to fall off. And Bobby insisted. He did it in rehearsal and it worked. So we, we got to do it. But yeah, the elephant was a working elephant. They assured us that he was used to crowds and that he wouldn't get spooked. But in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm sitting there. You ever see that? You ever see that video of the elephant going crazy in the parking lot and turning over, stomping on people and turning over cars and shit? Yes. I'm just envisioning that in my head, the elephant going crazy and just kind of going through ringside and stomping on people and turning shit over and knocking cameras. That elephant could throw anyone it wanted as far as it wanted. At any time. Yeah. And you had Caesar and Cleopatra up on top of it. Like that was they okay. Sure, yeah, but they sure is. No, nope, no, nope, he's used to crowds. And any and May worked out. But the, the other one was that damn, uh, uh, what the hell is that bird that had that was on Taker's deal? The vulture? It was a toucan. It was a fucking vulture. And that motherfucker, um, uh, that was a pain in the ass, and that was kind of scary because that, that son of a bitch tried to fly off in every rehearsal, and he was attached by a little chain on his foot to the to the podium there. But yeah, the vulture was an asshole to work with. Any pushback from the announcers on being in costume? There's been lots of talk over the years that Vince having Jim Ross dress in a toga for his debut show uh, wasn't always the plan, and that Vince just added it late in the game as a rib. Was it a rib? Absolutely not, and it was from day one, always the plan. Talk about the difficulties that working outdoors presents to the boys, uh, and then what about from a production standpoint? Is it a lot different being in the ring in the daytime like this in the fucking desert? Yeah, because you have no, obviously, no environmental uh, control, so to speak. It's, it's hotter than fuck, for one thing. But the the hardest thing is the reactions. You, you're not getting a good read on the crowd because you don't have anything to contain that noise, and you're not getting that immediate feedback from the crowd. So it's a lot more difficult to work. From a production standpoint, it's a nightmare because you're dealing with the sun. You're dealing with Mother Nature. And lighting can just be a pain in the ass because you cannot avoid that dusk and when the sun's going down what's going to what's going to work and how to make that ideal because there is no ideal situation for that Meltzer spent a lot of time praising Jim Ross in his debut here and said that Bobby Heenan did a fine job too uh how do you think that everyone felt Jim did in his debut and was Vince pleased with his investment after the debut how was Gorilla with all of this because he's going to go on to replace Gorilla on Wrestling Challenge too Gorilla wasn't feeling that well at the time, and Gorilla was looking to slow down quite a bit, and we were going to use Gorilla as the uh, president, kind of a figurehead type deal, and use him for special appearances and ambassador role. I think everybody was pleased as punch with JR. I thought he did a great job. I think Vince thought he did a great job, too. Uh, Did Ross bring an emphasis to the hotline business for you guys? It feels like um, that would have been something he would have wanted to push. Uh, according to the rumor and innuendo, uh, he had made like half a million dollars for WCW the prior year, just on the hotline. Is that something you guys thought was a financial opportunity? Did he try to pitch it or sell it? Or is that all just bullshit? No, that was something that Jr. brought knowledge of that Vince was definitely interested in any, any kind of money-making revenue stream. Hell yeah. We're interested in. Um, as has been the case for many prior WrestleManias, uh, there's seemingly timing problems, or at least, uh, Meltzer would report that he says that a Kamala Bigelow match was canceled and a lot of the other matches late in the card were cut short on time because some of the early matches ran long. Um, who ran long and why, why does Shawn Michaels do this? <laughs> Nobody ran long. Oh, okay. So you just, he would be incorrect there. So why did you cut Kamala and Bigelow? 
we didn't cut Kamala and Bigelow. Vince did because Vince wanted to make sure that he had enough time on the end because Hogan must pose. That's why Vince wanted to make damn sure that he had enough time on the end. Uh, Meltzer does write a glowing review of the local promotion for the show. Um, he says that there was a lot of families there to see Hulk Hogan. And the day before the show, there was an autograph session with a lot of wrestlers, the biggest of which was the undertaker. And they drew about 6,000 people to Caesars for that. And then held a brunch the day of the show where Luger attacked and knocked out Bret Hart. Um, were you guys surprised at the turnout for an autograph session? 6,000 is more than you're drawing at house shows. So to have that for an autograph session seems like a pretty damn big deal. It was, it was a huge deal, but that was also, um, and our hats off to Basil DeVito and the promotions team for that, because they work really closely with a lot of local sponsors and local businesses to get that done. I don't think anybody expected that kind of turnout. What was the deal with the brunch? That was the, the angle with, uh, Luger and Brett and they never show it. So, but they mentioned it a lot on the broadcast that he knocked out Brett Hart. What's the deal with that? It was uh, something with Caesars for the high rollers to give them an opportunity to meet the stars. And I don't know who the, I don't know if boxing did it or somebody else had, had done this. And it was something that Caesars wanted to do. So we did it. We looked at it as an opportunity to shoot an angle. I don't know why the hell we didn't ever use it. A lot of uh, markets uh, report that they didn't, not a lot, uh, a handful of markets don't carry the pay-per-view, saying there's a lack of interest. Uh, the crowd was around 15,000, very few of which were freebies, and it was pretty much a full house. But they were still tell- still selling some of the more expensive tickets uh, right up until uh, they got going. They, they suspect that going into the show, the gate is going to be somewhere between 1 and 1. 1.2 million. So only a little down from the previous year, which as a minute ago we said was over 60,000 fans, but at 1.25. So now with a quarter of the fans, we're going to do almost the same money. So it gives you an idea of how drastic the promotion was here. Did you guys know ahead of time that some cable systems would be passing and not carrying the event, or do you just find that out after the fact? Yeah, I didn't know the major cable systems did pass on the event. So that, yeah, that's news to me. Uh, in the dark match on the show, Tito Santana pins Papa Shango after Shango misses a splash off the top rope in about eight minutes. Meltzer rates the match a dud. Do you remember this match in particular? Yeah, I do. It's just simply to get guys out there, test the cameras, and give the crowd a match before the big event and make people happy. Shawn Michaels wrote in his book, By the time my shoulder healed, we were fast approaching WrestleMania 9. Vince wanted me to have a few warm-up matches before the big WrestleMania show. So he sent me to Memphis where I wrestled Jeff Jarrett on March 29th and Lawler on the 30th. It sounded simple. Of course, nothing is simple with me anymore. After my match with Jerry, the ref went to hand me my belt and ended up smashing me in the mouth and knocking out my front tooth. I had to rush home to Dallas the next day to get a dentist to put a cap in my mouth. So now I'm coming into WrestleMania having just healed from a separated shoulder and a knocked out tooth. And Chris Chavis and I had no storyline going into our match. We went 20 minutes before I was counted out. He was very big and thick and a little difficult to move. The match wasn't bad, but it just wasn't anything special. Um, And so Tatanka beats Shawn Michaels by count out after 18 minutes and 13 seconds. Uh, Michaels came out with a new manager or valet in Luna Vachon Sherry, meanwhile, is in Tatanka's corner. Originally, this was Gennetti. Uh, they pushed the debut of a Sean pretty hard here, and the finish comes uh, when Sean misses a crossbody off the apron and falls to the floor. Uh, Joey Morella is counting out Michaels, who then knocks him down. Michaels gets back into the ring, but Tatanka hit his Samoan drop and covered him for the pin, but Morella got up and called for the bell, ruling Michaels the loser by count out. Meltzer says this is a very weak finish to what he thought was an excellent opener. Uh, After the match, uh, Luna clotheslined Sherry and kicked her a few times. And then later in the show, they announced that Luna has attacked Sherry in the first aid room as well. And he rated the match three and a half stars. What did you think of the match, Bruce? I thought the match wasn't bad. The 
the idea behind it was, well, and we were going to do Marty Janetti going in, but Marty had been fired previous. So it was, it was a rush deal. It was get the match on the card, get something out there. Couldn't have uh, Tatanka lose because of his undefeated streak. And it was simply a way to, to get the guys on there. And I, I hate finishes like that. I really do. Let's talk about uh, Luna Vachon here for a minute. Why the pairing with her and Sean? Is this just so she can oppose Sherry since they had just done the Sherry angle? Yes, and it was it was Sherry's suggestion to bring Luna in. It was kind of a Beauty and the Beast in reverse, <laughs> with Sean being the Beauty and Luna rest her soul being the Beast. But it was somebody for Sherry to to work with, and they liked each other and they had great matches. Um, it feels like Sean has something to prove here. I want to know if you agree with that. He had worked with Tito the year before at WrestleMania eight. Uh, and then he main event of the survivor series against Brett six months earlier for the title, but he's in the doghouse for coming in kind of fucked up for the Royal rumble where he had just partied too hard and jacked up his face and they had to put makeup on him. We covered that earlier in the show. And now after main eventing a pay-per-view, and being the Intercontinental Champion, he's in the opening match, albeit with the Intercontinental title. Do you think this is the match where he kind of drew the line in the sand and said, I'm going to make WrestleMania my show, and then eventually became Mr. WrestleMania? I think Sean always had something to prove. Anytime that Sean went out in a featured event, no matter what it was, I think Sean always had something to prove and wanted to say to anybody that, Came behind him. Follow that bitch. So yeah, I, I think. But I'll I'll go back one one more to the Tito match. Sean being spotlighted as a single, I think he took every opportunity to shine. Match number two on the card is the Steiner brothers beating the Head Shrinkers after fourteen minutes and twenty two seconds. The first big spot was Samu doing what appeared to be a stun gun on Scott, but Fatu pulled the ropes down. And Scott took a nasty bump to the floor. Scott pinned Samu after a Frankensteiner, which Meltzer says is missed noticeably. Uh, it gets two and a half stars. What do you think of the uh, Steiner Brothers WrestleMania debut here, Bruce? Frankly, I thought it was an excellent match, and I think it still holds up today. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Those guys used to beat the shit out of each other, and they could all go. Uh, match number three, Doink the Clown. He pinned Crush after eight minutes and 28 seconds. Not much crowd reaction from a grudge match that was pushed so hard. Uh, Doink did a pile driver early, though they never acknowledged Crush's back uh, bad neck from the uh, angle. Uh, they traded some decent action with Crush getting his crush move on once, but Doink making the ropes. And then the second time, Doink hit the ref and tried to go under the ring, but Crush pulled him out. So he puts the move on again, but there's no ref. So a second Doink runs in and hits Crush with a fank arm. And then the ref counts the fall. Fans actually started cheering this finish. Uh, the two doinks then start making weird faces at each other, doing the mime bit. Uh, and it was really well done. The second doink, or so it says, is Steve Kern, who has, of course, shaved off his beard to play the role. He hid under the ring before the show started and then stayed under the ring until the show was over. Uh, and all the fans had left the building, which explains his disappearance with nobody seeing him. Uh, the match gets a star and a half. Bruce, I realize I'm probably in the minority here, but God, I know he said it earlier. I just love this doink idea. Uh, the My Mac was super fun afterwards. Uh, what did you think of the match? Who pitched Kern? What details can you provide about this match? Well, I happen to agree with you. I loved the finish and the finish was something that that pat patterson and i came up with uh steve kern i think steve kern is the one who may have pitched him being the second doink and it was kern pitching being a second doink and something else that kind of spurred the idea of the the double doinks in the finish i I enjoyed the hell out of it. You're right. The crowd didn't buy. They didn't buy Crush. They didn't buy the match. They weren't into it. But the the mime gimmick in there was from the old uh, I Love Lucy show. Yeah. With Harpo Marks. And, and that's, <laughs> that's where we came up with that from. 
It was also the realization at this point with the double doinks that we said, "Uh uh-oh, we might have a baby face on our hands in doink because the crowd enjoyed how clever doink was. And so the finish might have backfired on us a little bit, and that started the babyface turn for Doink a lot sooner than we anticipated. Well, next up is a guy who would turn babyface that summer, Razor Ramon. He pins Bob Backlund after 3 minutes and 45 seconds, and he does so with an inside cradle. Uh, Meltzer wrote, fans cheered Ramon. This was probably the first pinfall loss Backlund has ever done in the WWF, and that must date back to 1977. Terrible minus one star. Uh, this seems like a throwaway match. If you had to keep it short for Ramon because of his knee, why do it like this, Bruce? I mean, what was the long-term plan here for Backlund? You got a guy who hasn't lost since Moses was in short pants. And now you're beating him in under four minutes. Simply to get the match out there and not hurt razor any more than we had to. That's it. Why not put Bigelow out there with razor? Because Razor was advertised with Backlund, and Vince wanted to see Razor get a win. Uh, match number five. Here we are. Ted DiBiase and IRS, Money, Inc. retain their tag team titles against Hulk Hogan and Brutus the fucking Barber Beefcake. After 18 minutes and 27 seconds, they do this by DQ. Uh, here's some quotes from The Observer. Hulk's left eye was shut. On TV, they gave a cover story that he was working out in the gym the night before the match and was attacked. The story going around was that he was involved in a boating accident on Wednesday night, although everyone who saw him up close said it looked like someone punched him in the eye. The injury was legit, not makeup, although the reasons aren't clear, and when asked later, Hogan said he didn't want to talk about it. DiBiase was just about as big as Hulk, actually a bigger frame, although Hogan had a lot better muscle mass and tone. (sighs) Let's talk about the eye. Uh, It's worth mentioning a couple weeks after this, Meltzer would write, quote, although rumors are abounding everywhere as to the source of Hulk Hogan's black eye, the most likely reason seems to be a boating accident. Hogan wrote about this in his book, and he actually had a whole chapter titled The Jet Ski Incident. He says basically the day he was forced to, supposed to leave for Vegas, uh, he rode jet skis with two friends, one of which was Brutus the fucking Barber Beefcake. Uh, and Barber had just gotten the new fast jet ski that Hogan wanted to ride. Hogan also admits that he had been drinking beer for 12 hours on the plane ride home from England, where we just talked about he was over there to promote Mr. Nanny. So by his own admission, he is, as he says, buzzing. Uh, He says he tried to jump a wave on this new jet ski and it threw him over the jet ski. uh, And then it came behind him and smacked him in the eye going 40 miles an hour, crushing his orbital bone. Now, most people, when they have an orbital bone crushed, have to have surgery or wear a mask. Not Hulk Hogan, brother. Uh, He says he went unconscious and the friend, the third friend, happened to be the stunt coordinator for Baywatch. And that guy saved Hogan's life. Hogan thinks he would have drowned. If that guy wasn't there, uh, he even wrote specifically quote, if it had hit me in the side of the head, I would have been dead. If it had center punched me right between the eyes, it probably would have ripped the top of my skull off. But instead it hit me underneath my eyeball and broke my orbital socket. I was in pretty bad shape. My eye was messed up. My jaw was messed up. I was a disaster to look at End quote. He says his doctor didn't want him to board a plane, much less wrestle like this. But of course, Hogan says, I'm not missing WrestleMania, brother. And he even admits to, quote, swerving the athletic commissioner. And those are his words. He says he told the guy that he was wearing makeup and it was all the work a put on, he says. And the guy believed him. Uh, He also writes this, quote, the funny thing is, there's a rumor that I didn't get hurt in a jet skiing accident after all, that I got punched in a bar fight by Randy Savage. Brother, I wish. Getting hit in a bar would have been a lot easier than getting slammed in the face by a 700-pound jet ski. Bruce, you were there. What did you hear happened? When did you hear this rumor? Well, we heard what happened the night that it happened uh, when Hulk called Vince and told him about the jet ski and said that his, he got his uh, eye messed up a little bit. We didn't really know the extent of the injury until we saw him, but 
as far as Savage, I believe Savage was actually in Las Vegas with us, so um, that didn't happen. But I talked to Beefcake, talked to Hulk, and talked to Ellis Edwards, all three who were there, and they all pretty much tell the exact same story, that it was a jet ski accident. The speed at which the jet ski might have been <laughs> going 40 miles an hour to hit him in the eye, um, I don't know. None of us were there, but I find that a little maybe a little exaggerated, but everybody tells the same story that, yeah, he took a bump off the jet ski and the jet ski was circling like they do when you fall off of the damn things and popped him right in the face. They don't always do that, by the way, because if you're using it properly, you're wearing the key around your wrist. <laughs> and it kills it. And when you come off, it's over. A- yeah, actually, it's supposed to kill the damn uh, engine, kill the motor. But if you fall off, if you fall off of it and you slip through, and I know this from experience because I've done this too, it goes in a circle. Let's it, run, it, let's run through this. Hogan's been drinking for twelve hours before he starts to operate motor vehicles. Not a good idea. <laughs> I know, I know that too on the water, especially. Uh, yeah, none of that's a good idea, but that that is the same story that I heard from Ellis, same story I heard from Beefcake, same story I heard from Hulk, and it's never deviated over the years. They tease a walkout countout finish six minutes in, and the ref changes the rules and announces if they're counted out, the world tag team titles will change hands. That's silly, of course, but it's the WWF, so roll tide. Uh, they go another 12 minutes to go roughly 18 minutes in the match. And they take their third ref bump in the fifth match. Um, it looks like the bad guys are going to win, but then all of a sudden, uh, Beefcake has IRS pinned, and Jimmy Hart slides in with a referee jacket and counts the pinfall and hands the belts to Hogan and Beefcake. But then the ref comes to and disqualifies them after seeing Jimmy in the ring. So Jimmy throws the ref out of the ring after the match, and the faces open up IRS's briefcase and find the money in there, and they start handing it to fans at ringside. Who would have put this match together? Who put together uh, matches for Hogan? Who was the agent? Is that Pat? That would be Pat. Uh, three ref bumps in five matches. Does that ever come up, or is that just smart marks like us who keep up with this? That's just smart marks like you that keep up with this. But but in fairness, um, it's gotten hopefully it's gotten a lot better. Back then, yeah, it was Gaga, for Gaga's sake. So you have Gaga. Nobody pays attention. I think that it does matter. I think that it hurts the product when you do too much of that bullshit. Ted DiBiase wrote in his book, quote, For years, due to the World Wrestling Federation's demanding road schedule, I conducted myself in a very immoral and unprincipled manner. Not only was I drinking and using drugs, I was unfaithful in my marriage. Although I'd been happily married to Melanie for more than a decade, my overinflated ego led me to womanizing. In 1993, shortly before WrestleMania 9, Melanie found out about this behavior. I begged for her forgiveness. The thought of losing everything that I love, my wife and children, scared me to death. Luckily for me, Melanie agreed to give me a second chance. In the interest of saving my marriage, I decided that wrestling in Japan was the best thing to do. He talks about his neck injury from here and how he realized he needed to phase out his in-ring career but he went and finished this japanese tour and he later writes about three months before wrestlemania 9 i walked into vince mcmahon's office and gave him my notice that i'd planned to leave the world wrestling federation i really respected vince and what he had done for me and so much for my career but my faith wasn't strong enough to keep me from being dragged back into my old ways my marriage was at stake after a lengthy conversation vince accepted my decision to leave and wished me the best of luck my last match as a wrestler for the World Wrestling Federation was at SummerSlam in August of 93. Do you remember this spiritual decision from Ted to move away from the uh, demons, I guess is the word people like to use in the wrestling business, and him asking Vince for an opportunity to step away from the road vividly it was it was a bad time in ted's life and he he was devastated when his his wife was going to leave him and he didn't want that he had a family and just 
felt that the only thing that he could do was get away from what he thought was the bad guy. So, yeah, I remember it vividly. Ted had a hard, had a rough, rough patch at that point. Anything else or time to move on? No, time to move on. Lex Luger pins Mr. Perfect after nearly 11 minutes with a backslide, although Perfect was in the ropes. Meltzer writes that Luger had the best ring entrance, coming in with four bikini-clad women and holding four mirrors with sparklers coming from them. And Meltzer notes the two didn't work well together and that they seemed kind of clumsy. Luger would write in his book that when they locked up, and by the way, it's worth mentioning that Luger was, has, has written that he was very excited to be working with Perfect because Perfect had a reputation as such that if you were working him, it was almost a night off. You didn't have to think about anything. He would call everything, and it would be, pardon the pun, perfect. Well, on this night, he had laid out everything, but when they lock up, perfect says, what are we doing again? And he just drew a blank and got lost. And perfect has admitted that before he passed away too, that he just kind of forgot. He spaced out and just drew a blank as to what they were going to do. Uh, after the match, uh, Luger knocked out Mr. Perfect with a forearm. Perfect got up and ran to the back and, uh, called up with Luger near a tool shed. Luger was with Michaels, who gave Perfect a super kick and beat him with sticks and garbage cans and a Memphis-style beatdown. And Meltzer says this angle was great, in his opinion. He thinks the match was anything but, but it put a lot of heat on the idea that Luger had now knocked out both Perfect and Hart in the same day with a forearm to give the impression that something was fishy. Meltzer gives it a star and a quarter. Now, we've covered this match on our Lex Express episode and our Mr. Perfect episode in great detail. If you'd like to go back and hear about either one of these guys, they're in our archives right now. Anything you want to add to this match here, Bruce? What did you think of the match? Were you high on this gimmick? Was Vince high on it? Remind everyone of the rib that Mr. Perfect liked to do with Luger's trunks here. Vince was very high on the narcissist gimmick. He was infatuated with Lex Luger. And he's a god damn what a phenom. Uh, what's a what's the damn word that he always used to to describe Lex? Um, specimen. Yeah. Well, specimen, but but when you're uh, you got good genes. Ah, oh, God, he's got awesome genetics. It, it just was. Hey, in 2016, he was high on the term striations. Striations. I, heard, I had multiple people tell me that he described a certain someone in their physique by saying, look at the striations. I've never heard that. So apparently he, he likes the word vascular and striation, at least in the that, last vascular, year. Vascular, so. yes. Yeah, God damn the vascularity. <laughs> but the uh, look at that genetics. He's a genetic freak. He was high on Luger, man. He thought Luger was going to be the second coming of, of Hulk Hogan. So he was high on this narcissist gimmick. I tell you, the, the match was not great, and it wasn't Perfect's best night. It, everything that Lex said about having a night off working with Kurt Hennig was true, but on this night, it wasn't. And we talked about the rib, and, and like I said, in both in both shows, you can go back and, and listen to Mr. Perfect and, and Lex Luger, the Lex Express shows in our archives. Perfect was the consummate river, and every match that he had with Luger, Luger had tassels on his trunks. And Kurt would just pull off one tassel every night and put it in his tights, and he would come back and give it back to Lex at the end of the night. Lex, being the fastidious person that he is, it drove Luger nuts that Kurt would pull off one tassel every night because eventually his tassels would just have like this bald spot where Kurt would choose and pull the tassels off. And, and it was just a little rib that perfect like to do to just get Lex a little off of his game and drive him nuts. But it wasn't their best outing. Wasn't the best match. Sure as hell wasn't perfect's best match by far. But I also have to say that it takes two to tango. The Undertaker beat Giant Gonzalez in 7 oh. minutes and 33 seconds by DQ. Meltzer writes, it could have been a lot worse. Campy moment of the show was when Ross was talking about the steps being solid steel after The Undertaker took a bump into them. He then took a second bump and knocked one step upside down, and it was completely hollow. Second campy moment was when Ross was talking about 
giant being eight foot tall when less than a year prior, he was referring to him as seven foot seven. Harvey Wimpleman gave Gonzalez a towel and he smothered Undertaker with it. On TV, they said it had chloroform, but nobody in the live audience knew that or what was going on. Gonzalez was DQ'd and did a great choke slam on his caretaker, Bill Alfonso. Uh, Undertaker was then stretchered out and left for dead, but came back to life and knocked Gonzalez out of the ring. Gonzalez will sell tickets, but not for long. So that's what Meltzer's take is. He gives it a star and a quarter. And I got to say, Bruce, I'm pretty excited to talk about Giant Gonzalez. This is as wrestle crap as it's going to get. And uh, I don't know when we'll talk about him again. So who the fuck came up with this gear? Wow. Creative Services delivered a drawing of a giant. And it was like a cartoon drawing. Almost like maybe how you would imagine Wolverine. Okay? Right. That's that's one thing to be able to draw that and create that in a, in a movie and have a lot of special effects and shit like that to make it look good or a werewolf or something like that. This was a fucking bodysuit with hair on it <laughs> and painted muscles on it. To say it looked horrible would be an understatement. But we were in it. It was too late. Vince loved it, thought it made him look unique and, and scary and intimidating. It, I thought it was terrible. I, it was, it was bad. And then poor Taker. Taker goes from working Jake, the snake Roberts to working the giant Gonzalez. And the giant just couldn't, couldn't do a whole lot. Taker was, was, was having his working shoes on at this time and really getting into having great matches and shit. And this wasn't it. I, to this day, Taker still brings up, you booked me with giant Gonzalez at WrestleMania. And whenever they would show those, uh, you know, 25 and Oh undertaker, WrestleMania (laughs) victories and shit. He would just shoot that look where he would turn and snap his head and stare you down every time that Giant Gonzalez's picture would come up and just kind of stare at us and go, you did that to me. Uh, but what he was, hated it. What was he like in real life? Giant Gonzalez or Taker? Who, who do you think? I don't know. You G- Giant out, Gonzalez, you fucking asshole. Very quiet. Nice guy, just but very quiet. There was a language barrier. He was Argentinian and he spoke Spanish, so it was a little difficult to communicate with him. How did Taker was, call spots with him? Did uh, t- Taker habla espanol? Very carefully. They had it all laid out, and he didn't do a whole lot. There wasn't a whole lot to call there. <laughs> what was your favorite Giant Gonzalez move? There wasn't one. I was going to say out of the business. Um, did he ever hurt anybody that you know of? I don't know that he was capable of hurting anybody. So he was a gentle giant. He was a very gentle giant. He wasn't really capable of it and too nice to want to hurt anybody. Is he the worst wrestling giant ever? Or can you think of one worse? He's tied up there with uh, Ron Reese, the Yeti. I can't wait to talk about him with Tony Schiavone on our sister show. What happened when, uh, how quickly after signing Gonzalez, did you guys realize that, uh, as they say in Arrested Development, I've made a huge mistake. When the bell rang. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. Uh, Doesn't get old. Uh, how do you think Bruno did as a manager here? It's Harvey Wimpleman. Okay. I, I thought the Harvey Wimpleman gimmick was great with uh, the bully Busick and Sid. I'm not sure that it. It worked here, but it was a nice visual having a little tiny Harvey with the giant. It was always good to have Harvey with a big giant of a man to manage. What was uh, Harvey's um, role at this point? Like besides on air, was it just on air? Just on air as a manager, that's it. Got any good Bruno stories you can share with us? Not really. Uh, Let's briefly discuss The Undertaker's entrance here. This is kind of his first grand WrestleMania entrance, is it not? I mean, he had wrestled in prior ones, but he just walked to the ring. Uh, who was in charge of stuff like this at the time? You know, the big entrances for Undertaker and whatnot. 
when we were looking at the spectacle, we, we tried to think of unique things for different guys. And Undertaker was kind of coming into his own. Is is this big um, attraction? So when we looked at the props that we had available to us from Caesar's Palace, you know, they gave us a list of animals that they had that they could use that we could use and, and be a part of this whole thing. And one of them was a vulture and this big uh, the 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 carriage thing that he came down in. So it, it just fit. And we got down. How about the undertaker with a big vulture? And that, that was it. So it just fit naturally. They had it available. <laughs> it was on a list of gimmicks for Caesar's Palace. And we, we chose that for the undertaker. I thought it looked pretty cool. Woo, boys, WrestleMania is here. I don't have tickets, but I do have the game time app. I'm in business. You see, game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. And that includes WrestleMania with killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped about all the fun you'll have when Cody Rhodes brings it home, by God. Serious business. What I like best about game time is the low price guarantee. Not even the low price, the lowest price. How about that? They've got you covered with event cancellation protection, job loss protection. We're talking peace of mind when you use the game time app. Let me explain this game time guarantee. It means you always get the best price. Always. Here's what I mean. If you find the tickets in the same section and row for less money, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. How do you beat that? And you also eliminate the guesswork. We've all bought tickets before and we wonder, well, is that a good seat? Buddy, they got images of seat views. So you don't just look at the little map and say, oh, that's where it'll be. They give you a perspective shot so you can say, okay, well, damn, that's going to be a pretty good shot. I like it. I got stuck with really bad WrestleMania tickets once. I was behind one of the doggone poles. That will happen with the game time app. You can find flash deals, last minute tickets. You can do it up until the very last day of the event. That's right. The day of the event on Saturday, you want night one tickets. No problem on Sunday. You want night two tickets. No problem. You gotta get the game time app. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any easier. You buy tickets in a matter of seconds, two taps. You're all set. The tickets are sent straight to your phone. You don't even have to dig through your doggone email. So what are you waiting for? Snag the tickets without the stress with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use the code wrestle for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code wrestle for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So I don't know where we'll talk about this again. If we don't talk about it right now, somewhere here in the show, uh, Hogan is doing a promo and he refers to Yokozuna as a Jap. Now, obviously this would never fly in 2017 and we're going to beat up on the Hulkster here in a little bit. Uh, but kind of put this into a frame of reference. Obviously it was offensive, but as they say, times were different. I mean, I'm sure that's what you're going to say here. Am I right? That's exactly what it was. It was just a different time, different place. And I guess that some of those stereotypes were probably more acceptable in society. And thank God they're, they're not anymore. And people are a little bit more sensitive that to that today. Yeah. It's fucked up that we have to go back in 2017 and say, well, it was more acceptable then, but it, it maybe yeah, I know it's crazy. Right? <laughs> maybe it wasn't, uh, you know, more acceptable per se, but it was more common. Now that doesn't make it right. We're not excusing that. Uh, but that was something that was in other forms of media at the time too. And no, that doesn't make it right that wrestling did it. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to get to is I imagine, and I wasn't there, that nobody really batted an eye when Hogan said this at the time. Am I right? Obviously so, yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody would have questioned it at all at the time. Do you remember any sort of backlash whatsoever from Fuji or Yokozuna or anybody else? No, never. And see, that's what I find is interesting is in this very episode, we're talking about how, you know, there are boycotts coming from Los Angeles and sensitivity groups for Asian Americans there. But yet here we are. After all of that, saying Jap, is that just still not something that 
you know, crosses Vince's mind when you guys are producing this? Well, I, I think that when you go back and you look at things and you talk about great American heroes and John Wayne's John Wayne used the same phrase in movies. And it was just, as you said, more common. I don't know that it was necessarily acceptable per se, or maybe shouldn't have been acceptable, but it was just more common at that time for the, the American hero to use that kind of slang. Yeah, it doesn't does, make it right. Yeah, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't age well. Uh, I, I think we all wish it wouldn't have happened. But at the time, for whatever reason, it did. Okay, so let's get to it. It's the main event. Yokozuna, Bret Hart. Uh, before we talk about the match, let's talk about what Bret wrote in his book. He says that when he first got, his, uh, got to Vegas with his parents, Vince wanted to meet with him. Uh, so he goes and sits down with Vince, and Vince says, this is what I want to do. I want you to drop the belt to Yoko tomorrow. This was not what I had expected. I sat there dumbstruck as he went on to explain how Fuji would screw me, throwing salt in my face, blinding me. And after Yoko was handed the belt, Hogan would rush to my aid and in some kind of roundabout way would end up winning the belt from Yoko right then and there. Like I was handing Vince my sword, I told him I appreciated everything he did for me and I'd do whatever he wanted. Vince said, don't get bitter. I still have big plans for you. Sound bites flashed through my mind of Vince assuring me that I was the long-term champion, not to worry about Hogan, who still hadn't even spoken to me yet. As I stood up to leave, I asked, did you take the belt from me because I didn't do a good enough job? Of course not. I'm just going in a different direction. I'm still onwards and upwards for you. Nothing much is going to change for you. I was still totally crushed. As I lay in bed that night, the more I thought about what Vince had in his mind for Hogan, the more I felt that it would completely backfire on both of them. The hokey finish would stink, and maybe not immediately, but in the weeks to come, my fans, who were the biggest contingent of Vince's paying audience at that time, would gag on it. There was something different about my fans. They really believed in me as a person. By the time I got to the dressing room the following afternoon, word that I was losing the title had leaked out to the boys. Most of them were quiet, and some were angry. The Nasty Boys, Sean, Taker, and several others expressed their utter disappointment. Knowing I was losing the belt didn't stop me from planning on having a great match. I went over everything with Yoko and designed the match so that all the best moves were left for the final minute. Hogan arrived with his entourage, his wife, his manager, Beefcake, and Jimmy Hart. Clearly, he'd been in the know all along, probably from the first day he came back. Now he was suddenly acting like my long-lost pal and wearing a big smile that rightfully belonged to me. During our match, it was hot and dry in the desert, but a cool breeze made it impossible to work up a healthy sweat. An exhausted Yoko stampeded like a runway elephant, short-charging on my comeback and editing out all of my best spots. I was furious that he would take it upon himself to go home on his own. That's how I came to find myself crouched low, desperately hanging on Yoko's two massive calves in the sharpshooter, fighting with every ounce of strength not to let go. Fuji was caught off guard by the sudden ending, and it took him forever to find, unwrap, and throw a packet of what was actually baby powder into my eyes, supposedly blinding me. I fell back as Yoko hooked my leg and Hebner counted one, two, three. Right on cue, Hogan hit the ring protesting the injustice that had been done to me, and Earl put on that classic expression of utter stupidity that all pro wrestling refs wear when convenient. As I feigned blindness, Hogan helped me out of the ring. Fuji stayed in the ring, absurdly challenging Hogan to a title match with Yoko right then and there. Yoko was still teetering from exhaustion and looking for a second win that wasn't there. Hogan blinked in astonishment at his sudden good fortune. As scripted, with my face buried in the crook of my arm, I waved to him to avenge my loss. Go get him, Hulk! I was really thinking, go ahead, Hogan. Take from me what I worked so hard to get. We'll just see how long you last. Hogan was champion again without even having a match, and before I'd even made it backstage. He simply ducked the powder that Fuji threw in his face, clotheslined Fuji, and dropped his big leg on Yoko. And I could hear the one, two, three, and the roar of the crowd, and Hogan's music thumping. I couldn't help but stare at the TV monitor, watching Hogan work the crowd, the same old posing routine, a hand behind the ear, shaking the world title belt in the air, as if it to say it belonged to him all along. A few minutes later, he came up to me, excited and happy, and said, Thank you, brother. I won't forget it. I'll be happy to return the favor. 
I looked my old friend in the eye and said, I'm going to remember that, Terry. As for Yoko, I was always a little pissed off at him for going home on me and not letting me show Vince, Hogan, and everyone else that we could tear the house down without their bullshit finish. Even so, it was the best match that Yoko ever had. Meltzer would rate it three stars. It goes eight minutes and 55 seconds. Uh, what did you think of the match? And do you remember that sequence of events pretty much the way Bret Hart laid out in his book? Yeah, pretty much. That's the way that's the sequence of events in the order that they happened. I thought that the match was good. The, you know, the idea of Hulk winning the title probably came up a few weeks before, um, WrestleMania. Let me, let me give you this. Hulk Hogan wrote in his book, it would be another chance for events to see if he could move beyond Hulkamania to see if his company could go on without me, just like it had gone on without all the other stars who left over the years. If they would have gotten behind me and pushed Hulkamania as hard as ever, we may have gotten the company's momentum back. Instead, Vince chose to go a different way. He didn't have anything as exciting as Hulkamania, so everything gradually started to come crashing down. Then the federal government started to really put pressure on Vince. They tore the guts out of his business, and he had a hard time regrouping. So it all just hit bottom. The industry, the wrestlers, fan interests, the numbers, and my future with the WWF. By mutual agreement, I was gone for almost a year. During that time, I filmed Mr. Nanny, and I also started wrestling again in Japan, where the fans still love me regardless of the steroid mess. It was a refreshing change, brother. I didn't have to cut my hand to my ear to get the crowd behind me. I didn't have to do the big boot in the face and the leg drop to get a big cheer. I could just go out to the ring and wrestle. It was fun. But back in the U.S., the wrestling business was just getting worse. Finally, it seemed like Vince McMahon was willing to put me back in the spotlight, if only for a little while. I was going to wrestle at WrestleMania 9 in Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Not in the main event, but in a tag team match. The main event would pit Yokozuna, a 700-pound challenger, against the champion, Bret Hart. Yokozuna was slated to win the match and take the heavyweight belt. Here's where we get cooking. But then when I got to the building, I told Vince, Look, man, we both know I'm done here. The moment has passed. The love affair is over. But I've got an idea that will allow me to pass the torch. And what's that, Vince said. After my tag match is over, when Bret Hart gets beat by Yokozuna, how about if I come out to protest the way Bret lost? Yokozuna's manager, Mr. Fuji, can challenge me to get in the ring against Yokozuna, and boom, I can beat Yokozuna to win the title. Then I go to the next pay-per-view and drop the belt right back to Yokozuna, and I'm out of here. That was the deal. Vince agreed to it, and I thought, boy, I just stole me a couple more big paydays. And I didn't mind doing a job for Yokozuna, because I love the guy to death. It was all set. So now a minute ago, you said this was the case before Hogan's taking credit as it being his idea when he's in Vegas. Yeah, and that would be wrong. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll explain to you again the narrative and why it's wrong. This is what I wanted you to remind me about. We're, we'll talk about pay-per-view and, and all of that right now. So as I said, a few weeks before, Vince, and I assume it was after a conversation with Hulk, Vince feels is going to give added value to the European tour to have Hulk go over there with the championship. I says, came up with this idea and this thing to uh, switch the title at WrestleMania to do the thing with Brett, everything that was laid out by Brett. Behind the scenes even more, DirecTV was becoming a player in the pay-per-view game. And cable companies uh, on demand pay where you could order your pay-per-view channels with your remote control was becoming a big thing. You didn't have to call the cable company to order pay-per-view. And the Grateful Dead, I believe, were the first people to ever do this. They had a huge concert on pay-per-view, a live concert with the Grateful Dead. Got tremendous response. The cable companies came back a week later, and did an encore presentation of the Grateful Dead concert. And 
because of word of mouth and how great this concert was, and if you missed it live, here's your second chance to see the Grateful Dead. We're going to show an encore presentation all weekend long on DirecTV. Because if you would look at those pay-per-view channels, you would see just emptiness, and, and they would be running the same same movie in, on 10 different channels. <coughs> so the, the airtime was essentially free. And I posed the question to Vince. He's pitching this idea. I said, hey, the Grateful Dead did this deal. I explained the whole Encore presentation. I said, what if... I love the idea of switching the title to Hulk because on Monday we now have an opportunity to promote Monday night on Raw an encore presentation. If you missed WrestleMania, because prior to this, you had the live opportunity to see the pay-per-view, and that was it. The pay-per-view's on at 4 o'clock, the pay-per-view, whatever time it was on. It was on one time. And maybe you got a repeat for the West Coast. But that was it. They didn't have repeats. And I said, so we are promoting all the way up into this, you know, Bret Hart versus Yokozuna, Hulk Hogan, the Mega Power, or uh, Beefcake and them against Money, Inc. But now on Monday, we have an opportunity to talk about, holy shit, what a great event. New world champion, Hulk Hogan. And people are going, what? Because they didn't know Hulk was even competing for the WWF championship. So now you have a story to tell on Monday. You have a second chance to sell pay-per-view with an event that you couldn't promote before that. And we pitched it to some of the uh, promotion and marketing people who all shit on it. But Vince liked it. And he said, well, let's try it. So it was kind of a twofold deal. It was one, he wanted to get the title on Hogan for in his in his head to add value to the European tour. And two, let's try this encore presentation because it's a unique approach. You talk about what you're going to expect in your promotion for an event. Now, after the event, you can promote, holy shit, what you missed. So for those of you that didn't buy the pay-per-view event, this weekend, all weekend long, you're going to have another opportunity to see it and see Hulk Hogan become the WWF champion. So, yes, we knew in advance. And we had already put the wheels in motion to have the encore the next weekend and had all those spots, and we would have everything ready for Monday to promote that. It was not organic. It did not happen that weekend. Meltzer even wrote as much, saying on television Monday night, they announced that Yokozuna was filing a protest and that a ruling would be made on television as to the future of the title. The ads for the replay of Mania talk about seeing the title change hands twice in the same night at the greatest WrestleMania ever. So it's clearly a marketing ploy from the beginning. I'm curious about something that you're not going to want to give me a straight answer on, so just talk around it. Did Hogan make... More money than anybody on the card that night? I have no idea. Freestyle again. I, I don't I don't know. I I don't know. I wasn't doing payoffs then, so I really don't know. Hogan didn't work the tapings the next week and in fact only worked three dates in May in tag matches against Money Inc. He did work a Japanese date and spent some time filming the Thunder in Paradise pilot. The plan was for him to come back in June and work three days a week with Duggan taking a spot when he was off. Bruce, in hindsight, was the decision to have Dogan, or Hogan rather, win the belt a knee-jerk reaction, or is it a mistake, I guess is what I'm asking, considering that he's got all these other irons in the fire with Mr. Nanny and Thunder in Paradise and wants a limited schedule and top money, and does this not seem a little bit unworkable? Well, I do think, in hindsight, that it was a knee-jerk reaction. I also think in hindsight, that it would have been better to stay the course. Um, I wouldn't have had a problem dropping the title to Yoko and leaving it on Yoko for a while. However, the decision was always, we knew Hogan was going to go make movies. We knew Hogan was going to go do his yeah. TV show. So the decision to put the title on him was never long-term anyway. It was a short-term fix. It was a short-term idea for a short-term return. That was it. It was a shot in the arm. Um, hindsight being 2020, 
Was it the best decision? Probably not. A week later, Meltzer writes that WrestleMania did a 2.1 buy rate, which would be about 430,000 buys or roughly a $5.8 million gross for Titan. He also says this would be the lowest of any previous WrestleMania, but that was expected. Uh, And the amount of the drop between this year and the previous year was less than had been the case in the previous years. So five to six was a big dip. Six to seven was a big dip. Seven to eight, another dip. So the dip from eight to nine was not as bad. So in a weird way, it's a good sign that we're not losing as much as we've been losing, but we're still losing. Uh, Meltzer writes, one estimate is that Hogan's appearance at this show was worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.2 million based on pay-per-view. It's harder to determine the live gate. But did you ever get numbers like that, that when we added this guy, this is the effect it made to the pay-per-view buys? No, not really, no. That's hard to tell. I mean, that's all speculative. It comes out after the fact that um, a lot of casino buys apparently were not actually claimed. So people were given comps to move from their cheaper seats into the more expensive sections. So while they claimed to sell out, it wasn't actually a sellout, uh, but they probably still got paid from the casino. So it wound up being a really big swing for Titan. So the idea here again is, Caesars and the casinos may have actually paid for the tickets. So whether or not they're all actually there or used or sat in doesn't matter as much because they made their money. So it does matter when you watch the match and you see people just kind of waving at the camera and sitting on their hands. A lot of them aren't wrestling fans, but the tickets were paid for and they did really, really well compared to WrestleMania eight. And by comparison at the Hoosier dome, there's 62,000 people there. So the money's not that different. But the money is a lot better from a net profit standpoint. So while the gross may be similar, the net is a lot more here, if that makes sense. Um, Do you remember this being perceived as being a financial success after the show? It wasn't. It was not considered a failure. So it, it, it was decent money and it was better business than we had been doing. So yeah, I was, they were happy with it. Uh, hindsight is always 2020, but you agree that Hogan maybe wasn't what was best for business long-term, but he was what was best for business short-term. Yes. If you had to do it over again today, would you do it the same way or would no. you keep it with Yoko? No, I, w- I probably would have kept it with Yoko. That would have been the first WrestleMania where a heel finishes the show as champion. That would have been okay for you, but not maybe not Vince, right? Oh, it always would have been. <laughs> yes, it definitely. Vince wouldn't have liked that at all. He would have fought that tooth and nail. Many believe this to be the worst WrestleMania of all time. What say you? Let me think about that one. Um, either eight or, yeah, eight or nine. So, yeah, it could be up there, definitely. It may be the worst. Okay, so uh, before we get to how Brett confronted Hogan, uh, I had a minute during the Rob Taylor commercial there to pull it in my Google machine, and I'm going to call bullshit on something, Bruce. Just a little while ago, you were dying on the hill that we needed to have Hogan as a part of this European tour, and... I thought you were referencing the summer tour, which I knew he wasn't on. He was gone by then. But you maintained to know there was one in April, which made sense because they always go to Europe right after WrestleMania. Well, I pulled the results up. Let's run through some. Uh, April 8th in Paris, France, Yokozuna works with Jim Duggan. The next day in Bournemouth, England, uh, on April 9th, Yokozuna works with Jim Duggan. The next day, in somewhere in England, April 10th, Yokozuna works with Jim Duggan. The next day in Sheffield, Yokozuna, you want to guess who he worked with? Jim Duggan. Uh, And then we're back to Scotland. You want to guess who Yokozuna worked with? Who did Hogan work with? He's not on any of the fucking shows. Sure he is. He's got to be. In, in May? No, in April. He's not on any of them. Yeah, but in May he was. 
Okay, well, you were saying that it was right after WrestleMania, so I threw it in my Google machine. Well, May is after WrestleMania. Okay, so you're maintaining... Between WrestleMania and uh, King of the Ring. Mm, let's see. Memphis, yeah, Manhattan yeah. Center, Louisville, Los Angeles, San Francisco. We're not We're not to Europe yet. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Nova Scotia, Ontario. Yeah, they didn't go to Europe in May. Yeah, they did. They went to Europe between <laughs> WrestleMania and King of the Ring. I agree. They did it. it. They did it the next and week in April. It was Hogan that did it. Hogan's Hogan not on, was on the card. No, he's not. Well, um, that was the reason it was done. <laughs> go back. Do you have my books there? Go back and look through my books. I'm telling you, he's not on them. Okay. Well, I'm telling you the reason it was done. And that was the idea behind it. He worked a house. It was Hogan's farewell tour overseas. But he never did it, is what I'm saying. Are you calling bullshit on this? Dude, I, I don't know. I don't have the he worked books sh- in front of me. He worked a show in in Japan on May 3rd. And uh, we, we kind of alluded to that a little earlier. Uh, he worked in the Manhattan Center in May. He, uh, you know, did some interview so segments. Where did, where did Hogan work in April and May? You tell me he didn't work. No, uh, I'm not saying he didn't work. That, if you tell me that they didn't work overseas, I'm probably going to say that your information online may be incorrect. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, do you have my books there? Uh, I don't. Did you leave '94 here? I don't know. I'm in 93 here. I think so. I'm telling you, I'm looking at it. And, uh, the homie is not on the fucking show. It's earlier. You argue you're you're looking at what is reported online by someone, right? Are you looking at WWE's? I'm looking at the history of WWE.com and it, it goes through specifically day by day. It's worth mentioning that this is the, this is the same batch of information that we have consistently used here on the show. And you're going to yeah, say what you consistently use. Well, yeah, I'm the only one who does any fucking research on this show. Not always correct. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, well, I mean, what, what can you say to this? I feel like you've just been busted. How have I been busted? Well, because you just are because, because no, I just gave you the reason of why <laughs> the title was given to Hogan. That's it. We, we I put, mean, we, you know, you're, now you're, you're trying to be a Bob Costas. And I got you, pal. No, I'm just well, trying. You weren't a part of the conversations. <laughs> you weren't a part of the meetings as to why Vince wanted to put the title on Hogan. And Hogan was, I'm looking at Hogan's run in 19, it's 1993, right? Yeah. I don't have it here. I don't have the, uh, well, dude, I don't have my book here. I think you've got them there. And I, I'm not looking at what you have. So I, I'm sorry. I can't answer what you're saying is, is the case. I'm sure Dave Meltzer and, and all the rest of the dirt sheet world will jump all over it, but I'm giving you the exact reasons as to why the switch was made. If he was pulled from the deal, then he was pulled from the deal, but the original idea behind it and why Vince wanted to make the change. It wasn't done the day of. It was done weeks ahead of time. We had the pay-per-view encores all set up. It was so Hulk would be champion on a European tour for his farewell tour. If you don't want to believe that, then don't fucking believe it. So you're saying he did appear on the European tour and the internet has now colluded to make sure that no one reported it and we kept it a secret. Dude, I don't have my book in front of me. I'm giving you my recollection. You asked me why Hogan, why we made the switch with Hogan. I gave you the reason why we made the switch with Hogan and how that all came about. Now, if he didn't go on the tour, if he didn't make that, then I don't recall that because I didn't do research on a goddamn European tour. And if you have wrong information, you may have wrong information. If he didn't make the tour, maybe he didn't make the tour. But the reason why the title switched to Hogan at WrestleMania 9. 
was because he was going on a European tour for a fucking farewell tour. Fuck you. To go over and be the champion. So let me ask this. Uh, is this, in your opinion, now that you know he didn't make the tour, that Lynn- I don't know if he did or not. I know <laughs> you're showing information. Well, Conrad, you don't know if he made the tour or not either. You're looking at goddamn information on the internet. Has the internet ever been wrong? Can you find any evidence that he was there? I can find yeah, lots if got, of... If you get my fucking books, I can tell you. Okay, the book. your books don't say he was there. I don't believe you. <laughs> you didn't look at him. <laughs> Conrad, again, I didn't do research on the tours that took place after WrestleMania. I did my research on WrestleMania 9. That's what we were talking about. You asked for a reason why the championship was made. If you want to talk about Hogan missing dates after the fact, then we can go back and we can look at that research and talk about that. But where we are right now and what I have, and you asked about WrestleMania 9, why the title switch was made, that's why it was made. That was the rationale that was given. If Hogan was booked on that and then didn't come, then he didn't go. I don't know because I don't have that information in front of me. Now, that's what I'm asking, though, is uh, I, I believe I believe you when you're saying that's the rationale and that's the explanation that was given. I guess my follow-up question I'm trying to drill down on is, do you believe that Ho, uh, Vince thought he needed an explanation? Do you think that Vince was somehow romanticized by Hogan and thought this is the magic bullet and was sold by this uh, or on this by Hogan and needed a way to kind of spin it to Brett and everybody else, that this was essentially the farewell tour for Europe with him with the world title. Do you believe that that was the case? Or do you believe that it's more likely that Hogan agreed to that and it was the truth, but then pulled the, that doesn't work for me, brother routine? What doesn't work for him? Winning the title? Going to Europe. But that was the whole reason for Hulk coming back for that summer. The whole the whole situation was Hulk was coming back. We were going to get a European tour out of him. And he was gone after King of the Ring. But he, but I'm, he, he didn't go. So the question, Again, Conrad, I don't know, and I don't remember whether he went or not. I don't. I know that he was booked. I know that that was the whole concept b- between bringing Hulk back during that time frame. I guess what I'm we saying knew is, we had him for a short period of time. We knew that we had a small window to capitalize on Hulk coming back. We knew that we had an overseas tour. So, in your opinion, it's not that. Hulk lied or that Vince misrepresented it's he went and the internet's wrong. Okay. You know what? Here we go. July 30th. It was July. So excuse the fuck out of me. Dortmund, Germany, Hogan beat Yokozuna, uh, Offenbach, Germany, Hogan beat Yokozuna, Munich, Germany, Hogan beat Yokozuna, Berlin, Germany, Hogan beat Yokozuna, Edinburgh, Scotland, Hogan beat Yokozuna. London, England, Hogan beat Yokozuna. So it wasn't until July and August. Was he the world champion then? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) So my time frame time frame is off. Excuse the fuck out of me. But that was the goddamn Uh, idea. We've got to make him the champion so he can go to Europe and not be the champion. God damn it. It's simple, pal. It is. <laughs> you have consistently said he needed to go over there as champion when he and went. That was Vince's rationale. And he changed his mind about King of the Ring, maybe? Well, no, he probably changed his ring about fucking ever getting back to SummerSlam and coming back after that because he didn't do SummerSlam that year. This is fun. Yeah, but see, you didn't do your rest of the research for the rest of the summer. No, that was that's not that, that that's not fair. You have said consistently you wanted him to go there as champion when he went in August, which he, was the reason that we made the switch. But he wasn't that's the fucking Vince champion wanted. when he went because things changed. <laughs> 
I love you so much for that. When fucking Dave Meltzer says that, he's a jack off to you. But when you say it, it makes total sense. You goddamn right it does. <laughs> This lens we is- sit on that wall to protect you, motherfucker, because you need our protection. Ah, this was fun. Well, this wasn't a King of the Ring show, but we do want to go ahead and touch on what Hogan wrote in his book. He said, on April 4th, 93, at WrestleMania 9, I took the belt from Yokozuna for my record fifth championship. I pinned him one, two, three, paving the way for our rematch. But before we got to King of the Ring a month later... Bret Hart got in my face and said, you son of a bitch. Vince McMahon told me you won't drop the belt to me. I said, brother, I'm dropping the belt to Yokozuna. That's the deal I made. And Brett said, that's not what Vince told me. He said, you wouldn't drop the belt to me because I'm not in your league and I couldn't lace up your boots. I said, well, how about you and me getting in a room with Vince right now? Finally, the three of us, Vince, Brett, and myself wound up in a room together. Brett said to Vince, didn't you tell me that Hulk Hogan wouldn't drop the belt to me? And Vince said, quote, Brett, that's just what you thought you heard. I had a feeling that Vince wasn't going to be straight up with Brett, and I think Brett felt the same way. But Vince was the boss, so there's nothing Brett could do about it except fume a little. I was fuming a little myself, to tell you the truth. I didn't care if Brett Hart got the belt or not. It just pissed me off that Vince had told me one thing and then told Brett another because everybody thought it was my decision to not drop the belt to Brett. It made me look like I wasn't a team player. A month later, just as I had agreed my discussions with Vince McMahon, I dropped the belt back to Yokozuna at King of the Ring in Dayton, Ohio. Then I left the World Wrestling Federation. I wasn't fired and I didn't quit. It was a mutual agreement that I would no longer wrestle for the company after I lost the championship to Yokozuna. I would just pursue other interests. There wasn't any animosity between me and the company. I just walked out and that was it. But to tell you the truth, brother, it was a relief to move on. The drama had just gotten out of hand, with people bashing me left and right, calling me selfish for some of the things I had or hadn't done in my career when it was always the promoter who had asked me to do those things. I had been down a long, hard road, and it was nice to finally take a breather. So, Bruce, we're going to discuss King of the Ring another time, uh, but I wanted to at least include Hogan's testimony here because I know he's been villainized over this for years. Do you remember this sit-down and this confrontation and the three of them getting together in a room? I remember hearing all about it, and from my recollection... That's pretty accurate. What what Hulk written? The, well, yeah, what Hulk wrote there. The idea that, and again, it was me, Vince, and Pat that we had from the beginning was pretty much that that Hogan would beat Yoko for the belt, and he would drop the belt at King of the Ring after the European tour back to Yoko, and then we would move on with Brett and Yoko. That Hogan was short term; he was going on to do his Thunder in Paradise and do all of his Hollywood stuff. So there was never any intent to keep him beyond that and brett felt that hope that hulk should drop the title to him and pass the torch there's rumor and innuendo out there that you guys even did a a photo shoot on a beach with brett hart and hulk hogan playing tug of war with the belt never heard that one you don't remember that no i sure don't if anybody has a picture of that, tweet it at the show, uh, at yeah. Pritchard Show. We would love to uh, share that with our listeners. Uh, do you remember there ever being a conversation about Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan having a match at SummerSlam? There was always discussion about that. Wouldn't that be great? And Bret, that's what Bret wanted. Bret wanted to face Hulk and wanted Hulk to pass the torch to him. At SummerSlam. It, um, either at King of the Ring or SummerSlam, yeah. But Vince didn't see that. Vince felt that was a babyface match and that it wouldn't do anyone any good. If Hulk lost to Brett, it would hurt Hulk and vice versa. But Vince was never in favor of that match. Well, why do you think Vince didn't like it? Because it was two babyfaces and he had learned his lesson against Warrior? Yes. And the fact that he wanted to push Brett and putting Brett against Hulk, he felt would hurt Brett at that time in a baby face situation, you know, and I know that's going to piss off a lot of fans, but I, I tend to agree there because your old school, traditional wrestling fans, when given the option, I mean, casual fans, you know, 
when given the option of who you're going to cheer for, like my dad's a casual wrestling fan. My dad's cheering for Hulk Hogan all day. Sure. And also to that point, uh, I remember bringing up, well, why don't we just turn Hulk heel? God damn it. Hulk Hogan will never be a heel. They won't boo him. Um, we'll see how that turned out. You know, we need to talk about that another time when we break down Hogan year by year, because uh, there are a lot, there's lots of rumor and innuendo about that and when it was discussed and who was for it and who was against it. Hey guys, need to call a quick time out here. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling my listeners over at OU didn't know for a while now about all the cool things happening over at adsfreeshows.com. A brand new series has arrived on ad free shows. Top of the card unpacks everything you need to know in the wrestling trading card space. And we're starting with the granddaddy of them all, the 1982 Wrestling All-Stars Series A set. Now, this set was not exclusive to any one territory at the time, as we were still right at the tail end of the territory era of professional wrestling. So it was a basically a who's who in professional wrestling. With card number one being Andre the Giant. Others included in the set include Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, Ted DiBiase, and others. 20 years ago, Eric took on Stone Cold in the main event on Raw, but the real main event was the confrontation that happened backstage before the show. Now, the next week, I'm sitting in this chair, and that same guy, I don't think I had said a word to him that day. I don't think I had seen Rick up until the point he came through that door, and he's, you know, getting me, he's just telling me to get up, get out of the chair, and he's so pissed off. He's bleeding. I'm on the phone, and he's got blood <laughs> running down his chin because he bit his lip. He was so mad, he bit the inside of his mouth. He's got he blood on a backstage confrontation. I hadn't even gotten out of the chair yet. <laughs> Ad Free Shows members got to sit shotgun alongside Kevin Nash and click this co-host, Sean Oliver, as they watch back some of the worst matches in history. None more so than the Yeti. Randy the, now. The mummy is not Frankenstein. You don't walk with your arms straight out. With like the that. arms out, right? And, a, and yeah. you know, a, a Yeti is also not a mummy, but I don't know. Was it Jim Hurd? Who was here? Well, well, whose brainchild was this? Who gives a fuck? That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself why Ads Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adsfreeshows.com.